Chapter Twenty Nine of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the cellar, I had meanwhile stood silent. There was no reason for me to obtrude myself, and I was happy not to do so. This does not mean, however, that my presence was not noticed. Mr. Trome honoured me with more than one glance during these trying moments, in which I read the anxiety he felt, lest my peace of mind should be too much disturbed, and when, in response to the undoubted dismissal he had received from Lucetta, he prepared to take his leave, it was upon me he bestowed his final look and most deferential bow. It was a tribute to my position and character which all seemed to feel, and I was not at all surprised when Lucetta, after carefully watching his departure, turned to me with childlike impetuosity, saying, "'This must be very unpleasant for you, Miss Butterworth, yet must we ask you to stand our friend. God knows we need one.' "'I shall never forget I occupied that position toward your mother,' was my straightforward reply and I did not forget it, not for a moment. "'I shall begin with the cellar,' Mr. Grice announced. Both girls quivered. Then Lorene lifted her proud head and said quietly, "'The whole house is at your disposal. Only I pray you to be as expeditious as possible. My sister is not well, and the sooner our humiliation is over, the better it will be for her.' and indeed lucetta was in a state that aroused even mr grice's anxiety but when she saw us all hovering over her she roused herself with an extraordinary effort and waving us aside led the way to the kitchen from which as i gathered the only direct access could be had to the cellar mr grice immediately followed and behind him came lorene and myself both too much agitated to speak at the flower parlour mr grice paused as if he had forgotten something but lucetta urged him feverishly on and before long we were all standing in the kitchen here a surprise awaited us two men were sitting there who appeared to be strangers to hannah from the lowering looks she cast them as she pretended to be busy over her stove this was so out of keeping with her usual good humour as to attract the attention even of her young mistress. "'What is the matter, Hannah?' asked Lucetta. "'And who are these men?' "'They are my men,' said Mr. Grice. "'The job I have undertaken cannot be carried on alone.' The quick look the two sisters interchanged did not escape me or the quiet air of resignation which was settling slowly over Lorene. "'Must they go into the cellar too?' she asked. Mr. Grice smiled his most fatherly smile as he said, "'My dear young ladies, these men are interested in but one thing. They are searching for a clue to the disappearances that have occurred in this lane. As they will not find this in your cellar, nothing else that they may see there will remain in their minds for a moment lucetta said no more even her indomitable spirit was giving way before the inevitable discovery that threatened them do not let william know were the low words with which she passed hannah but from the short glimpse i caught of william's burly figure standing in the stable door under the guardianship of two detectives I felt this injunction to be quite superfluous. William evidently did know. I was not going to descend the cellar stairs, but the girls made me. We want you with us, Lorene declared, in no ordinary tones, while Lucetta paused and would not go on till I followed. This surprised me. I no longer seemed to have any clue to their motives, but I was glad to be one of the party hannah under lorene's orders had furnished one of the men with a lighted lantern and upon our descent into the dark labyrinth below it became his duty to lead the way which he did with due circumspection 
what all this underground space into which we were thus introduced had ever been used for it would be difficult to tell at present it was mostly empty after passing a small collection of stores a wine cellar the very door of which was unhinged and lay across the cellar bottom we struck into a hollow void in which there was nothing worth an instant's investigation save the earth under our feet this the two foremost detectives examined very carefully detaining us often longer i thought than mr gryce desired or lucetta had patience for but nothing was said in protest nor did the older detective give an order or manifest any special interest in the investigation till he saw the men in front stoop and throw out of the way a coil of rope when he immediately hurried forward and called upon the party to stop the girls who were on either side of me crossed glances at this command and lucetta who had been tottering for the last few minutes fell upon her knees and hid her face in the hollow of her two hands loreen came around and stood by her and i do not know which of them presented the most striking picture of despair the shrinking lucetta or loreen with her quivering form uplifted to meet the shafts of fate without a droop of her eyelids or a murmur from her lips the light of the one lantern which intentionally or unintentionally was concentrated on this pathetic group made it stand out from the midst of the surrounding darkness in a way to draw the gaze of mr gryce upon them he looked and his own brow became overcast evidently we were not far from the cause of their fears ordering the candle lifted he surveyed the ceiling above at which loreen's lips opened slightly in secret dread and amazement then he commanded the men to move on slowly while he himself looked overhead rather than underneath which seemed to astonish his associates who evidently had heard nothing of the hole which had been cut in the floor of the flower parlour suddenly i heard a slight gasp from lucetta who had not moved forward with the rest of us then her rushing figure flew by us and took up its stand by mr gryce who had himself paused and was pointing with an imperious forefinger to the ground under his feet you will dig here said he not heeding her though i am sure he was as well acquainted with her proximity as we dig repeated loreen in what we all saw was a final effort to stave off disgrace and misery my duty demands it said he someone else has been digging here within a very few days miss knollys that is as evident as is the fact that a communication has been made with this place through an opening into the room above see and taking the lantern from the man at his side he held it up toward the ceiling there was no hole there now but there were ample evidences of there having been one and that within a very short time Lorene made no further attempt to stay him. The house is at your disposal, she reiterated, but I do not think she knew what she said. The man with the bundle in his arms was already unrolling it on the cellar bottom. A spade came to light, together with some other tools. Lifting the spade, he thrust it smartly into the ground toward which Mr. Grice's inexorable finger still pointed at the sight and the sound it made a thrill passed through lucetta which made her another creature dashing forward she flung herself down upon the spot with lifted head and outstretched arms stop your desecrating hand she cried this is a grave the grave sirs of our mother end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Investigation. 
the shock of these words if false most horrible if true still more horrible threw us all aback and made even mr gryce's features assume an aspect quite uncommon to them your mother's grave said he looking from her to loreen with very evident doubt i thought your mother died seven or more years ago and this grave has been dug within three days i know she whispered to the world my mother has been dead many many years but not to us we closed her eyes night before last and it was to preserve this secret which involves others affecting our family honour that we resorted to expedients which have perhaps attracted the notice of the police and drawn this humiliation down upon us i can conceive no other reason for this visit ushered in as it was by mr trome miss lucetta mr gryce spoke quickly if he had not i certainly could not have restrained some expression of the emotions awakened in my own breast by this astounding revelation miss lucetta it is not necessary to bring mr trome's name into this matter or that of any other person than myself i saw the coffin lowered here which you say contained the body of your mother thinking this a strange place of burial and not knowing it was your mother to whom you were paying these last dutiful rites i took advantage of my position as detective to satisfy myself that nothing wrong lay behind so mysterious a death and burial can you blame me miss would i have been a man to trust if i had let such an event as this go by unchallenged she did not answer she had heard but one sentence of all this long speech you saw my mother's coffin lowered where were you that you should see that in some of these dark passages let in by i know not what traitor to our peace of mind and her eyes which seemed to have grown almost supernaturally large and bright under her emotions turned slowly in their sockets till they rested with something like doubtful accusation upon mine but not to remain there for mr gryce recalled them almost instantly by this short sharp negative no i was nearer than that i lent my strength to this burial if you had thought to look under mother jane's hood you would have seen what would have forced these explanations then and there and you i was mother jane for the nonce not from choice miss but from necessity i was impersonating the old woman when your brother came to the cottage i could not give away my plans by refusing the task your brother offered me it is well lucetta had risen and was now standing by the side of loreen such a secret as ours defies concealment even providence takes part against us what you want to know we must tell but i assure you it has nothing to do with the business you profess to be chiefly interested in nothing at all then perhaps you and your sister will retire said he distracted as you are by family griefs i would not wish to add one iota to your distress this lady whom you seem to regard with more or less favour as friend or relative will stay to see that no dishonour is paid to your mother's remains but your mother's face we must see miss lucetta if only to lighten the explanations you will doubtless feel called upon to make it was loreen who answered this if it must be said she remember your own mother and deal reverently with ours which entreaty and the way it was uttered gave me my first distinct conviction that these girls were speaking the truth and that the diminutive body we had come to unearth was that of althea knollys whose fairy-like form i had so long supposed commingled with foreign soil the thought was almost too much for my self-possession and i advanced upon loreen with a dozen burning questions on my lips 
when the voice of mr gryce stopped me explanations later said he for the present we want you here it was no easy task for me to linger there with all my doubts unsolved waiting for the decisive moment when mr gryce should say come look is it she but the will that had already sustained me through so many trying experiences did not fail me now and grievous as was the ordeal i passed steadily through it being able to say though not without some emotion i own it is althea knollys changed almost beyond conception but still these girls mother which was a happier end to this adventure than that we had first feared mysterious as the event was not only to myself but as i could see to the acute detective as well the girls had withdrawn long before this just as mr gryce had desired and i now expected to be allowed to join them but mr gryce detained me till the grave was refilled and made decent again when he turned and to my intense astonishment for i had thought the matter was all over and the exoneration of this household complete said softly and with telling emphasis in my ear our work is not done yet they who make graves so readily in cellars must have been more or less accustomed to the work we have still some digging to do end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain strategy i was overwhelmed what said i you still doubt i always doubt he gravely replied this cellar bottom offers a wide field for speculation too wide perhaps but then i have a plan here he leaned over and whispered a few concise sentences into my ear in a tone so low i should feel that i was betraying his confidence in repeating them but their import will soon become apparent from what presently occurred light miss butterworth to the stairway mr gryce now commanded one of the men and thus accompanied i found my way back to the kitchen where hannah was bemoaning uncomforted the shame which had come upon the house i did not stop to soothe her that was not my cue nor would it have answered my purpose on the contrary i broke into angry ejaculations as i passed her what a shame those wretches cannot be got away from the cellar what do you suppose they expect to find there i left them poking hither and thither in a way that will be very irritating to miss knollys when she finds it out i wonder william stands it what she said in reply i do not know i was half way down the hall before my own words were finished my next move was to go to my room and take from my trunk a tiny hammer and some very small sharp pointed tacks curious articles you will think for a woman to carry on her travels but i am a woman of experience and have known only too often what it was to want these petty conveniences and not be able to get them they were to serve me an odd turn now taking a half dozen tacks in one hand and concealing the hammer in my bag i started boldly for william's room i knew that the girls were not there for i had heard them talking together in the sitting-room as i came up besides if they were i had a ready answer for any demand they might make searching out his boots i turned them over and into the sole of each i drove one of my small tacks then i put them back in the same place and position in which i found them task number one was accomplished when i issued from the room i went as quickly as i could below i was now ready for a talk with the girls 
whom i found as i had anticipated talking and weeping together in the sitting-room they rose as i came in awaiting my first words in evident anxiety they had not heard me go upstairs i immediately allowed my anxiety and profound interest in this matter to have full play my poor girls what is the meaning of this your mother just dead and the matter kept from me her friend it is astounding incomprehensible i do not know what to make of it or of you it has a strange look loreen gravely admitted but we had reasons for this deception miss butterworth our mother charming and sweet as you remember her has not always done right or what you will better understand she committed a criminal act against a person in this town the penalty of which is state's prison with difficulty the words came out with difficulty she kept down the flush of shame which threatened to overwhelm her and did overwhelm her more sensitive sister but her self-control was great and she went bravely on while i in faint imitation of her courage restrained my own surprise and intolerable sense of shock and bitter sorrow under a guise of simple sympathy it was forgery she explained this has never before passed our lips though a cherished wife and a beloved mother she longed for many things my father could not give her and in an evil hour she imitated the name of a rich man here and took the cheque thus signed to new york the fraud was not detected and she received the money but ultimately the rich man whose money she had spent discovered the use she had made of his name and if she had not escaped would have had her arrested but she left the country and the only revenge he took was to swear that if she ever set foot again in x he would call the police down upon her yes if she were dying and they had to drag her from the brink of the grave and he would have done it and knowing this we have lived under the shadow of this fear for eleven years my father died under it and my mother ah she spent all the remaining years of her life under foreign skies but when she felt the hand of death upon her her affection for her own flesh and blood triumphed over her discretion and she came secretly i own but still with that horror menacing her to these doors and begging our forgiveness lay down under the roof where we were born and died with the halo of our love about her ah said i thinking of all that had happened since i had come into this house and finding nothing but confirmation of what she was saying i begin to understand but lucetta shook her head no said she you cannot understand yet we who had worn mourning for her because my father wished to make this very return impossible knew nothing of what was in store for us till a letter came saying she would be at the sea station on the very night we received it to acknowledge our deception to seek and bring her home openly to this house could not be thought of for a moment how then could we satisfy her dying wishes without compromising her memory and ourselves perhaps you have guessed miss butterworth you have had time since we revealed the unhappy secret of this household yes said i i have guessed lucetta with her hand laid on mine looked wistfully into my face don't blame us she cried our mother's good name is everything to us and we knew no other way to preserve it than by making use of the one superstition of this place alas our efforts were in vain the phantom coach brought our mother safely to us but the circumstances which led to our doors being opened to outsiders rendered it impossible for us to carry out our plans unsuspected her grave has been discovered and desecrated 
and we she stopped choked loreen took advantage of her silence to pursue the explanations she seemed to think necessary it was simsbury who undertook to bring our dying mother from sea station to our door he has a crafty spirit under his meek ways and dressed himself in a way to lend colour to the superstition he hoped to awaken william who did not dare to accompany him for fear of arousing gossip was at the gate when the coach drove in it was he who lifted our mother out and it was while she still clung to him with her face pressed close to his breast that we saw her first ah what a pitiable sight it was she was so wan so feeble and yet so radiantly happy she looked up at lucetta and her face grew wonderful in its unearthly beauty she was not the mother we remembered but a mother whose life had culminated in the one desire to see and clasp her children again when she could tear her eyes away from lucetta she looked at me and then the tears came and we all wept together even william and thus weeping and murmuring words of welcome and cheer we carried her upstairs and laid her in the great front chamber alas we did not foresee what would happen the very next morning i mean the arrival of your telegram to be followed so soon by yourself poor girls poor girls it was all i could say i was completely overwhelmed the first night after your arrival we moved her into william's room as being more remote and thus a safer refuge for her the next night she died the dream which you had of being locked in your room was no dream lucetta did that in foolish precaution against your trying to search us out in the night it would have been better if we had taken you into our confidence yes i assented that would have been better but i did not say how much better that would have been giving away my secret lucetta had now recovered sufficiently to go on with the story william who is naturally colder than we and less sensitive in regard to our mother's good name has shown some little impatience at the restraint imposed upon him by her presence and this was an extra burden miss butterworth but that and all the others we have been forced to bear the generous girl did not speak of her own special grief and loss have all been rendered useless by the unhappy chance which has brought into our midst this agent of the police ah if i only knew whether this was the providence of god rebuking us for years of deception or just the malice of man seeking to rob us of our one best treasure a mother's untarnished name mr gryce acts from no malice i began but i saw they were not listening have they finished down below asked lucetta does the man you call gryce seem satisfied asked loreen i drew myself up physically and mentally my second task was about to begin i do not understand those men said i they seem to want to look farther than the sacred spot where we left them if they are going through a form they are doing it very thoroughly that is their duty observed loreen but lucetta took it less calmly it is an unhappy day for us cried she shame after shame disgrace upon disgrace i wish we had all died in our childhood loreen i must see william he will be doing some foolish thing swearing or my dear let me go to william i urgently put in he may not like me overmuch but i will at least prove a restraint to him you are too feeble see you ought to be lying on the couch instead of trying to drag yourself out to the stables and indeed at that moment lucetta's strength gave suddenly out and she sank into loreen's arms insensible when she was restored i hurried away to the stables 
still in pursuit of the task which i had not yet completed i found william sitting doggedly on a stool in the open doorway grunting out short sentences to the two men who lounged in his vicinity on either side he was angry but not as angry as i had seen him many times before the men were townsfolk and listened eagerly to his broken sentences one or two of these reached my ears let em go it it won't be now or to-day they'll settle this business it's the devil's work and devils are sly my house won't give up that secret or any other house they'll be likely to visit the place i would ransack but Lorene would say I was babbling. Goodness knows a fellow's got to talk about something when his fellow townsfolk come to see him, and here his laugh broke in, harsh, cruel, and insulting. I felt it did him no good, and made haste to show myself. Immediately his whole appearance changed. He was so astonished to see me there, that for a moment he was absolutely silent. Then he broke out again into another loud guffaw, but this time in a different tone. "'Why, it's Miss Butterworth,' he laughed. "'Here, Saracen, come pay your respects to the lady who likes you so well.' And Saracen came, but I did not forsake my ground. I had espied in one corner just what I had hoped to see there, and Saracen's presence afforded me the opportunity of indulging in one or two rather curious antics i am not afraid of the dog i declared with marked loftiness shrinking toward the pail of water i had already marked with my eye not at all afraid i continued catching up the pail and putting it before me as the dog made a wild rush in my direction these gentlemen will not see me hurt and though they all laughed they would have been fools if they had not and the dog jumped the pail, and I jumped, not a pail, but a broom handle that was lying amid all the rest of the disorder on the floor, they did not see that I had succeeded in doing what I wished, which was to place that pail so near to William's feet that, but wait a moment, everything in its own time. I escaped the dog, and next moment had my eye on him, he did not move after that, which rather put a stop to the laughter, which, observing, I drew very near to William, and with a sly gesture to the two men, which for some reason they seemed to understand, whispered in the rude fellow's ear, they found your mother's grave under the flower parlour, your sisters told me to tell you, but that is not all. They're trampling hither and yon through all the secret places in the cellar, turning up the earth with their spades. I know they won't find anything, but we thought you ought to know. Here I made a feint of being startled and ceased. My second task was done. The third only remained. Fortunately, at that moment, Mr. Grice and his followers showed themselves in the garden. They had just come from the cellar and played their part in the same spirit I had mine. Though they were too far off for their words to be heard, the air of secrecy they maintained, and the dubious looks they cast towards the stable, could not but evince, even to William's dull understanding, that their investigations had resulted in a doubt which left them far from satisfied. But once this impression made, they did not linger long together. The man with the lantern moved off, and Mr. Grice turned towards us, changing his whole appearance as he advanced, till no one could look more cheerful and good-humoured. "'Well, that is over,' he sighed, with a forced air of infinite relief. "'Mere form, Mr. Knollys, mere form. We have to go through these pretended investigations at times, and good people like yourself have to submit.' but I assure you it is not pleasant, and under the present circumstances, I am sure you understand me, Mr. Knollys, the task has occasioned me a feeling almost of remorse, but that is inseparable from a detective's life. He is obliged every day of his life to ride over the tenderest emotions, 
forgive me and now boys scatter till i call you together again i hope our next search will be without such sorrowful accompaniments it succeeded william stared at him and stared at the men slowly filing off down the yard but was not for a moment deceived by these overflowing expressions on the contrary he looked more concerned than he had while seated between the two men manifestly set to guard him the deuce he cried with a shrug of his shoulders that expressed anything but satisfaction lucetta always said but even he knew enough not to finish that sentence low as he had mumbled it watching him and watching mr gryce who at that moment turned to follow his men i thought the time had come for action making another spring as if in fresh terror of saracen who by the way was eyeing me with the meekness of a lamb i tipped over that pail with such suddenness and with such dexterity that its whole contents poured in one flood over william's feet my third task was accomplished the oath he uttered and the excuses which i volubly poured forth could not have reached mr gryce's ears for he did not return and yet from the way his shoulders shook as he disappeared around the corner of the house i judged that he was not entirely ignorant of the subterfuge by which i hoped to force this blundering booby of ours to change the boots he wore for one of the pairs into which i had driven those little tacks end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain relief the plan succeeded mr gryce's plans usually do william went immediately to his room and in a little while came down and hastened into the cellar i want to see what mischief they have done said he when he came back his face was beaming all right he shouted to his sisters who had come into the hall to meet him your secret's out but mine there there interposed loreen you had better go upstairs and prepare for supper we must eat william or rather miss butterworth must eat whatever our sorrows or disappointments he took the rebuke with a grunt and relieved us of his company little did he think as he went whistling up the stairs that he had just shown mr gryce where to search for whatever might be lying under the broad sweep of that cellar bottom that night it was after supper which i did not eat for all my natural stoicism hannah came rushing in where we all sat silent for the girls showed no disposition to enlarge their confidences in regard to their mother and no other topic seemed possible and closing the door behind her said quickly and with evident chagrin those men are here again they say they forgot something what do you think it means miss loreen they have spades and lanterns and they are the police hannah if they forgot something they have the right to return don't work yourself up about that the secret they have already found out was our worst there is nothing to fear after that and she dismissed hannah merely bidding her let us know when the house was quite clear was she right was there nothing worse for them to fear i longed to leave these trembling sisters longed to join the party below and follow in the track of the tiny impressions made by the tacks i had driven into william's souls if there was anything hidden under the cellar bottom natural anxiety would carry him to the spot he had most to fear so they would only have to dig at the places where these impressions took a sharp turn but was there anything hidden there from the sisters words and actions i judged there was nothing serious but would they know william was quite capable of deceiving them had he done so it was a question 
it was solved for us by mr gryce's reappearance in the room an hour or so later from the moment the light fell upon his kindly features i knew that i might breathe again freely it was not the face he showed in the house of a criminal nor did his bow contain any of the false deference with which he sometimes tries to hide his secret doubt or contempt i have come to trouble you for the last time ladies we have made a double search through this house and through the stables and feel perfectly justified in saying that our duty henceforth will lead us elsewhere the secrets we have surprised are your own and if possible shall remain so your brother's propensity for vivisection and the return and death of your mother bear so little on the real question which interests this community that we may be able to prevent their spread as gossip through the town that this may be done conscientiously however i ought to know something more of the latter circumstance if miss butterworth will then be good enough to grant me a few minutes conference with these ladies i may be able to satisfy myself to such an extent as to let this matter rest where it is i rose with right good will a mountain weight had been lifted from me proof positive that i had really come to love these girls what they told him whether it was less or more than they told me I cannot say and for the moment did not know that it had not shaken his faith in them was evident for when he came out to where i was waiting in the hall his aspect was even more encouraging than it had been before no guile in those girls he whispered as he passed me the clue given by what seemed mysterious in this house has come to naught tomorrow we take up another the trinkets found in Mother Jane's cottage are something real. You may sleep soundly tonight, Miss Butterworth. Your part has been well played, but I know you are glad that it has failed. And I knew that I was glad too, which is the best proof that there is something in me besides the detective instinct. The front door had scarcely closed behind him when William came storming in. He had been gossiping over the fence with Mr. Trome, and had been beguiled into taking a glass of wine in his house. This was evident without his speaking of it. "'Those sneaks!' cried he. "'I hear they've been back again, digging and stirring up our cellar-bottom like mad. That's because you're so dreadful shy, you girls. You're afraid of this, you're afraid of that. You don't want folks to know that Mother wants—' well well there it is now if you had not tried to keep this wretched secret it would have been an old matter by this time and my affairs would have been left untouched but now every fool will cry out at me in this staid puritanical old town and all because a few bones have been found of animals which have died in the cause of science i say it's all your fault not that i have anything to be ashamed of because i haven't but because this other thing, this damned wicked series of disappearances, taking place for aught we know a dozen rods from our gates, though I think, but no matter what I think, you all like, or say you like, old Deacon Spear, has made everyone so touchy in this pharisaical town that to kill a fly has become a crime, even if it is to save oneself from poison. I'm going to see if I cannot make folks blink askance at some other man than me. I'm going to find out who or what causes these disappearances. This was a declaration to make us all stare and look a little bit foolish. William playing the detective? Well, what might I not live to see next? But the next moment an overpowering thought struck me. Might this deacon spear by any chance be the rich man whose animosity Althea Knollys had awakened. End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four The Birds of the Air Lucetta The next morning I rose with the lark. I had slept well, and all my old vigour had returned. A new problem was before me, a problem of surpassing interest now that the Knollys family had been eliminated from the list of persons regarded with suspicion by the police. Mother Jane and the jewels were to be Mr. Grice's starting point for future investigation. Should they be mine? My decision on this point halted, and thinking it might be helped by a breath of fresh air, I decided upon an early stroll as a means of settling this momentous question. There was silence in the house when I passed through it on my way to the front door, but that silence had lost its terrors and the old house its absorbing mystery. Yet it was not robbed of its interest. When I realised that Althea Knollys, the Althea of my youth, had just died within its walls, as ignorant of my proximity as I of hers, I felt that no old-time romance, nor any terror brought by flitting ghost or stalking apparition, could compare with the wonder of this return, and the strange and thrilling circumstances which had attended it. And the end was not yet. Peaceful as everything now looked, I still felt that the end had not come. The fact that Saracen was loose in the yard gave me some slight concern as I opened the great front door and looked out. But the control under which I had held him the day before encouraged me in my venture, and after a few words with Hannah, who was careful not to let me slip away unnoticed, I boldly stepped forth and took my solitary way down to the gate. It was not yet eight, and the grass was still heavy with dew. At the gate I paused. I wished to go farther, but Mr. Grice's injunction had been imperative about venturing into the lane alone. Besides, no, that was not a horse's hoof. There could be no one on the road so early as this. I was alarming myself unnecessarily. Yet, well, I held my place, a little awkwardly, perhaps. Self-consciousness is always awkward and I could not help being a trifle self-conscious at a meeting so unexpected and... But the more I attempt to explain, the more confused my expressions become. So I will just say that, by this very strange chance, I was leaning over the gate when Mr. Trome rode up for the second time and found me there. I did not attempt any excuses. He is gentleman enough to understand that a woman of my temperament rises early and must have the morning air. That he should feel the same necessity is a coincidence, natural perhaps, but still a coincidence, so there was nothing to be said about it. But had there been, I would not have spoken, for he seemed so gratified at finding me enjoying nature at this early hour that any words from me would have been quite superfluous. He did not dismount, that would have shown intention, but he stopped and, well, we have both passed the age of romance and what he said cannot be of interest to the general public, especially as it did not deal with the disappearances or with the discoveries made in the Knollys house the day before or with any of those questions which have absorbed our attention up to this time. That we were engaged more than five minutes in this conversation, I cannot believe. I have always been extremely accurate in regard to time. Yet a good half hour was lost by me that morning, for which I have never been able to account. Perhaps it was spent in the short discussion which terminated our interview a discussion which may be of interest to you, for it was upon the action of the police. Nothing came of the investigations made by Mr. Grice yesterday, I perceive, Mr. Trome had remarked, with some reluctance, as he gathered up his reins to depart. Well, that is not strange. How could he have hoped to find any clue to such a mystery as he is engaged to unearth, 
in a house presided over by miss knollys how could he indeed yet i added determined to allay this man's suspicions which notwithstanding the openness of his remark were still observable in his tones you say that with an air i should hardly expect from so good a neighbour and friend why is this mr trohm surely you do not associate crime with the mrs knollys crime oh no certainly not no one could associate crime with the mrs knollys if my tone was at fault it was due perhaps to my embarrassment this meeting your kindness the beauty of the day and the feeling these all call forth well i may be pardoned if my tones are not quite true in discussing other topics my thoughts were with the one i addressed then that tone of doubt was all the more misplaced i retorted i am so frank i cannot bear innuendo in others besides mr trome the worst folly of this home was laid bare yesterday in a way to set at rest all darker suspicions you knew that william indulged in vivisection well that is bad but it cannot be called criminal let us do him justice then and for his sister's sake see how we can re-establish him in the good graces of the community but mr trome who for all our short acquaintance was not without a very decided appreciation for certain points in my character shook his head and with a smiling air returned you are asking the impossible not only of the community but yourself william can never re-establish himself he is of too rude a make the girls may recover the esteem they seem to have lost but william why if the cause of those disappearances was found to-day and found at the remotest end of this road or even up in the mountains where no one seems to have looked for it william would still be known throughout the county as a rough and cruel man i have tried to stand his friend but it's been against odds miss butterworth even his sisters recognize this and show their lack of confidence in our friendship but i would like to oblige you i knew he ought to go i knew that if he had simply lingered the five minutes which common courtesy allowed that curious eyes would be looking from loreen's window and that at any minute i might expect some interference from lucetta who had read through this man's forbearance toward william the very natural distrust he could not but feel toward so uncertain a character yet with such an opportunity at my command how could i let him go without another question mr trome said i you have the kindest heart and the closest lips but have you ever thought that deacon spear he stopped me with a really horrified look deacon spear's house was thoroughly examined yesterday said he as mine will be to-day don't insinuate anything against him leave that for foolish william then with the most charming return to his old manner for i felt myself in a measure rebuked he lifted his hat and urged his horse forward but having withdrawn himself a step or two he paused and with the slightest gesture toward the little hut he was facing added in a much lower tone than any he had yet used besides deacon spear is much too far away from mother jane's cottage don't you remember that i told you she never could be got to go more than forty rods from her own doorstep and breaking into a quick canter he rode away i was left to think over his words and the impossibility of my picking up any other clue than that given me by mr gryce i was turning toward the house when i heard a slight noise at my feet looking down i encountered the eyes of saracen he was crouching at my side and as i turned toward him his tail actually wagged it was a sight to call the colour up to my cheek 
not that i blushed at this sign of goodwill astonishing as it was considering my feeling toward dogs but at his being there at all without my knowing it so palpable a proof that no woman i make no exceptions can listen more than one minute to the expressions of a man's sincere admiration without losing a little of her watchfulness was not to be disregarded by one as inexorable to her own mistakes as to those of others i saw myself the victim of vanity and while somewhat abashed by the discovery i could not but realize that this solitary proof of feminine weakness was not really to be deplored in one who has not yet passed the line beyond which any such display is ridiculous lucetta met me at the door just as i had expected her to giving me a short look she spoke eagerly but with a latent anxiety for which i was more or less prepared i am glad to see you looking so bright this morning she declared we are all feeling better now that the incubus of secrecy is removed but here she hesitated i would not like to think you told mr trome what happened to us yesterday lucetta said i there may be women of my age who delight in gossiping about family affairs with comparative strangers but i am not that kind of woman mr trome friendly as he has proved himself and worthy as he undoubtedly is of your confidence and trust will have to learn from some other person than myself anything which you may wish to have withheld from him for reply she gave me an impulsive kiss i thought i could trust you she cried then with a dubious look half daring half shrinking she added when you come to know and like us better you will not care so much to talk to neighbours they never can understand us or do us justice mr trome especially this was a remark i could not let pass why i demanded why do you think mr trome cherishes such animosity towards you has he ever but lucetta could exercise a repellent dignity when she chose i did not finish my sentence though i must have looked the inquiry i thought better not to put into words mr trome is a man of blameless reputation she avowed if he has allowed himself to cherish suspicions in our regard he has doubtless had his reasons for it and with these quiet words she left me to my thoughts and i must say to my doubts which were all the more painful that i saw no immediate opportunity for clearing them up late in the afternoon william burst in with news from the other end of the lane such a lark he cried the investigation at deacon spear's house was a mere farce and i just made them repeat it with a few frills they had dug up my cellar and i was determined they should dig up his oh the fun it was the old fellow kicked but i had my way they couldn't refuse me you know i hadn't refused them so that man's cellar bottom has had a stir up they didn't find anything but it did me a lot of good and that's something i do hate deacon spear couldn't hate him worse if he'd killed and buried ten men under his hearthstone there is no harm in deacon spear said lucetta quickly did they submit mr trome's house to a search also asked loreen ashamed of william's heat and anxious to avert any further display of it yes they went through that too i was with them glad i was too i say girls i could have laughed to see all the comforts that old bachelor has about him never saw such fixings why that house is as neat and pretty from top to bottom as any old maid's it's silly of course for a man and i'd rather live in an old rookery like this where i can walk from room to room in muddy boots if i want to and train my dogs and live in freedom like the man i am yet i couldn't help thinking it mighty comfortable too 
for an old fellow like him who likes such things and don't have chick or child to meddle why he had pin cushions on all his bureaus and they had pins in them the laugh with which he delivered this last sentence might have been heard a quarter of a mile away lucetta looked at loreen and loreen looked at me but none of us joined in the mirth which seemed to me very ill-timed suddenly lucetta asked did they dig up mr trome's cellar William stopped laughing long enough to say, "'His cellar? Why, it's cemented as hard as an oak floor. No, they didn't polish their spades in his house, which was another source of satisfaction to me. Deacon Spear hasn't even that to comfort him. Oh, how I did enjoy that old fellow's face when they began to root up his old fungi!' Lucetta turned away with a certain odd constraint I could not but notice." it's a humiliating day for the lane said she and what is worse she suddenly added nothing will ever come of it it will take more than a band of police to reach the root of this matter i thought her manner odd and moving towards her took her by the hand with something of a relative's familiarity what makes you say that mr gryce seems a very capable man yes yes but capability has nothing to do with it chance might and pluck might but wit and experience not otherwise the mystery would have been settled long ago i wish i well her hand was trembling violently nothing i don't know why i have allowed myself to talk on this subject loreen and i once made a compact never to give any opinion upon it you see how I have kept it. She had drawn her hand away and suddenly had become quite composed. I turned my attention toward Loreen, but she was looking out of the window and showed no intention of further pursuing the conversation. William had strolled out. Well, said I, if ever a girl had reason for breaking such a compact, you are certainly that girl. I could never have been as silent as you have been, that is, if I had any suspicions on so serious a subject. Why, your own good name is impugned, yours and that of every other person living in this lane. Miss Butterworth, she replied, I have gone too far. Besides, you have misunderstood me. I have no more knowledge than anybody else as to the source of these terrible tragedies. I only know that an almost superhuman cunning lies at the bottom of so many unaccountable disappearances, a cunning so great that only a crazy person. Ah, I murmured eagerly, Mother Jane. She did not answer. Instantly I took a resolution. Lucetta, said I, is Deacon Spear a rich man? Starting violently, she looked at me amazed if he is i should like to hazard the guess that he is the man who has held you in such thraldom for years and if he were said she i could understand william's antipathy to him and also his suspicions she gave me a strange look then without answering walked over and took loreen by the hand hush I thought I heard her whisper. At all events, the two sisters were silent for more than a moment. Then Lucetta said, Deacon Spear is well off, but nothing will ever make me accuse living man of crimes so dreadful. And she walked away, drawing Loreen after her. In another moment she was out of the room, leaving me in a state of great excitement. This girl holds the secret to the whole situation, I inwardly decided. The belief that nothing more can be learned from her is a false one. I must see Mr. Grice. William's rhodomontades are so much empty air, but Lucetta's silence has a meaning we cannot afford to ignore. So impressed was I by this, that I took the first opportunity which presented itself of seeing the detective. 
This was early the next morning. He and several of the townspeople had made their appearance at Mother Jane's cottage with spades and picks, and the sight had naturally drawn us all down to the gate, where we stood watching operations in a silence which would have been considered unnatural by any one who did not realise the conflicting nature of the emotions underlying it. William, to whom the death of his mother seemed to be a great deliverance, had been inclined to be more or less jocular, but his sallies meeting with no response, he had sauntered away to have it out with his dogs, leaving me alone with the two girls and Hannah. The latter seemed to be absorbed entirely by the aspect of Mother Jane, who stood upon her doorstep in an attitude so menacing that it was little short of tragic. Her hood, for the first time in the memory of those present, had fallen away from her head, revealing a wealth of grey hair which flew away from her head like a weird halo. Her features we could not distinguish, but the emotion which inspired her, breathed in every gesture of her uplifted arms and swaying body. It was wrath personified, and yet an unreasoning wrath. One could see she was as much dazed as outraged. Her lares and panates were being attacked, and she had come from the heart of her solitude to defend them. I declare, Hannah protested, it is pitiful. She has nothing in the world but that garden, and now they are going to root that up. Do you think that the sight of a little money would appease her? I inquired, anxious for an excuse to drop a word into the ear of Mr. Grice. Perhaps, said Hannah, she dearly loves money, but it will not take away her fright. It will if she has nothing to be frightened about, said I, and turning to the girls, I asked them, somewhat mincingly for me, if they thought I would make myself conspicuous if I crossed the road on this errand, and when Lorene answered that that would not deter her if she had the money, and Lucetta added that the sight of such misery was too painful for any mere personal consideration, I took advantage of their complacence and hastily made my way over to the group who were debating as to the point they would attack first. Gentlemen, said I, good morning. I am here on an errand of mercy. Poor old Mother Jane is half imbecile and does not understand why you invade her premises with these implements. Will you object if I endeavour to distract her mind with a little piece of gold I happen to have in my pocket? She may not deserve it, but it will make your task easier and save us some possible concern. Half of the men at once took off their hats. The other half nudged each other's elbows and whispered and grimaced like the fools they were. The first half were gentlemen, though not all of them wore gentlemen's clothes. It was Mr. Grice who spoke. Certainly, madam. Give the old woman anything you please. But, and here he stepped up to me and began to whisper, You have something to say. What is it? I answered in the same quick way. The mine you thought exhausted has possibilities in it yet. Question Lucetta. It may prove a more fruitful task than turning up this soil. The bow he made was more for the onlookers than for the suggestion I had given him. Yet he was not ungrateful for the latter, as I, who was beginning to understand him, could see. Be as generous as you please, he cried aloud. We would not disturb the old crone if it were not for one of her well-known follies. Nothing will take her over forty rods away from her home. Now what lies within those forty rods? These men think we ought to see. The shrug I gave answered both the apparent and the concealed question. Satisfied that he would understand it so, I hurried away from him and approached Mother Jane. See, said I, astonished at the regularity of her features, now that I had a good opportunity of observing them. 
I have brought you money. Let them dig up your turnips if they will. She did not seem to perceive me. Her eyes were wild with dismay, and her lips trembling with a passion far beyond my power to comfort. Lizzie, she cried, Lizzie, she will come back and find no home. Oh, my poor girl, my poor, poor girl. It was pitiable. I could not doubt her anguish or her sincerity. The delirium of a broken heart cannot be simulated. And this heart was not controlled by reason. That was equally apparent. Immediately my heart, which goes out slowly, but none the less truly on that account, was touched by something more than the surface sympathy of the moment. She may have stolen, she may have done worse, she may even have been at the bottom of the horrible crimes which have given its name to the lane we were in. But her acts, if acts they were, were the result of a clouded mind, fixed for ever upon the fancied needs of another, and not the expression of personal turpitude, or even of personal longing or avarice. Therefore I could pity her, and I did. Making another appeal, I pressed the coin hard into one of her hands, till the contact effected what my words had been unable to do, and she finally looked down and saw what she was clutching. Then indeed her aspect changed, and in a few minutes of slowly growing comprehension, she became so quiet and absorbed that she forgot to look at the men, and even forgot me, who was probably nothing more than a flitting shadow to her. A silk gown! she murmured. It will buy Lizzie a silk gown. Oh, where did it come from? The good, good gold, the beautiful gold. Such a little piece, yet enough to make her look fine. My Lizzie, my pretty, pretty Lizzie. No numbers this time. The gift was too overpowering for her even to remember that it must be hidden away. I walked away while her delight was still voluble. Somehow it eased my mind to have done her this little act of kindness, and I think it eased the minds of the men too. At all events, every hat was off when I repassed them on my way back to the Knollis gateway. I had left both the girls there, but I found only one awaiting me. Lucetta had gone in, and so had Hannah on what errand I was soon to know. "'What do you suppose that detective wants of Lucetta now?' asked Lorene, as I took my station again at her side. "'While you were talking to Mother Jane, he stepped over here, and with a word or two induced Lucetta to walk away with him toward the house. See, there they are in those thick shrubs near the right wing. He seems to be pleading with her.' Do you think I ought to join them and find out what he is urging upon her so earnestly? I don't like to seem intrusive, but Lucetta is easily agitated, you know, and his business cannot be of an indifferent nature after all he has discovered concerning our affairs. No, I agreed, and yet I think Lucetta will be strong enough to sustain the conversation judging from the very erect attitude she is holding now. Perhaps he thinks she can tell him where to dig. They seem a little at sea over there, and living as you do a few rods from Mother Jane, he may imagine that Lucetta can direct him where to first plant the spade. It's an insult, Lorene protested. All these talks and visits are insults. To be sure, this detective has some excuse, but... Keep your eye on Lucetta, I interrupted. She is shaking her head and looking very positive. She will prove to him it is an insult. We need not interfere, I think. But Lorene had grown pensive and did not heed my suggestion. A look that was almost wistful had supplanted the expression of indignant revolt with which she had addressed me and when, next moment, the two we had been watching turned 
and came slowly toward us it was with decided energy she bounded forward and joined them what is the matter now she asked what does mr gryce want lucetta mr gryce himself spoke i simply want her said he to assist me with a clue from her inmost thoughts when i was in your house he explained with a praiseworthy consideration for me and my relations to these girls for which i cannot be too grateful i saw in this young lady something which convinced me that as a dweller in this lane she was not without her suspicions as to the secret cause of the fatal mysteries which i have been sent here to clear up to-day i have frankly accused her of this and asked her to confide in me but she refuses to do so miss loreen yet her face shows even at this moment that my old eyes were not at fault in my reading of her she does suspect somebody and it is not mother jane how can you say that began lucetta but the eyes which loreen that moment turned upon her seemed to trouble her for she did not attempt to say any more only looked equally obstinate and distressed if lucetta suspects any one loreen now steadily remarked then i think she ought to tell you who it is you do then perhaps you commenced mr gryce can persuade her as to her duty he finished as he saw her head rise in protest of what he evidently had intended to demand lucetta will not yield to persuasion was her quiet reply nothing short of conviction will move the sweetest natured but the most determined of all my mother's children what she thinks is right she will do i will not attempt to influence her mr gryce with one comprehensive survey of the two hesitated no longer i saw the rising of the blood into his forehead which always precedes the beginning of one of his great moves and filled with a sudden excitement i awaited his next words as a tyro awaits the first unfolding of the plan he has seen working in the brain of some famous strategist miss lucetta his very tone was changed changed in a way to make us all start notwithstanding the preparation his momentary silence had given us i have been thus pressing and perhaps rude in my appeal because of something which has come to my knowledge which cannot but make you of all persons extremely anxious as to the meaning of this terrible mystery i am an old man and you will not mind my bluntness i have been told and your agitation convinces me there is truth in the report that you have a lover a mr ostrander ah she had sunk as if crushed by one overwhelming blow to the earth the eyes the lips the whole pitiful face that was upturned to us remain in my memory to-day as the most terrible and yet the most moving spectacle that has come into my by no means uneventful life what has happened to him quick quick tell me for answer mr gryce drew out a telegram from the master of the ship on which he was to sail he explained it asks if mr ostrander left this town on tuesday last as no news has been received of him loreen loreen when he left us he passed down that way shrieked the girl rising like a spirit and pointing east toward deacon spears he is gone he is lost but his fate shall not remain a mystery i will dare its solution i i to-night you will hear from me again and without another glance at any of us she turned and fled toward the house end of chapter thirty three
Chapter thirty four of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conditions. But in another moment she was back, her eyes dilated, and her whole person exhaling a terrible purpose. Do not look at me, do not notice me, she cried, but in a voice so hoarse no one but Mr. Grice could fully understand her. I am for no one's eyes but God's. Pray that he may have mercy upon me. Then, as she saw us all instinctively fall back, she controlled herself, and pointing toward Mother Jane's cottage, said more distinctly, As for those men, let them dig. Let them dig the whole day long. Secrecy must be kept, a secrecy so absolute that not even the birds of the air must see that our thoughts range beyond the forty rods surrounding Mother Jane's cottage. She turned and would have fled away for the second time, but Mr. Grice stopped her. You have set yourself a task beyond your strength. Can you perform it? I can perform it, she said, if Lorene does not talk, and I am allowed to spend the day in solitude. I had never seen Mr. Grice so agitated. No, not when he left Olive Randolph's bedside after an hour of vain pleading. But to wait all day. Is it necessary for you to wait all day? It is necessary. She spoke like an automaton. Tonight at twilight, when the sun is setting, meet me at the great tree just where the road turns. Not a minute sooner, not an hour later. I will be calmer then. And waiting now for nothing, not for a word from Lorene, nor a detaining touch from Mr. Grice, she flew away for the second time. This time Lorene followed her. Well, that is the hardest thing I ever had to do, said Mr. Grice, wiping his forehead and speaking in a tone of real grief and anxiety. Do you think her delicate frame can stand it? Will she survive this day, and carry through whatever it is she has set herself to accomplish? She has no organic disease, said I, but she loved that young man very much, and the day will be a terrible one to her. Mr. Grice sighed. I wish I had not been obliged to resort to such means, said he. But women like that only work under excitement, and she does know the secret of this affair. Do you mean, I demanded, almost aghast, that you have deceived her with a false telegram, that that slip of paper you hold? Read it, he cried, holding it out toward me. I did read it. Alas, there was no deception in it. It read as he said. However, I began, but he had pocketed the telegram and was several steps away before I had finished my sentence. I am going to start these men up, said he. You will breathe no word to Miss Lucetta of my sympathy, nor let your own interests slack in the investigations which are going on under our noses. And with a quick, sharp bow, he made his way to the gate whither I followed him in time to see him set his foot upon a patch of sage. "'You will begin at this place,' he cried, "'and work east. And, gentlemen, something tells me that we shall be successful.' With almost a simultaneous sound, a dozen spades and picks struck the ground. The digging up of Mother Jane's garden had begun in earnest." End of chapter 34。chapter 35 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。the dove。I remained at the gate ; I had been bidden to show my interest in what was going on in Mother Jane's garden, and this was the way I did it but my thoughts were not with the diggers. I knew as well then as later that they would find nothing worth the trouble they were taking, and having made up my mind to this, I was free to follow the lead of my own thoughts. 
they were not happy ones i was neither satisfied with myself nor with the prospect of the long day of cruel suspense that awaited us when i undertook to come to x it was with the latent expectation of making myself useful in ferreting out its mystery and how had i succeeded i had been the means through which one of its secrets had been discovered but not the secret and while mr gryce was good enough or wise enough to show no diminution in his respect for me i knew that i had sunk a peg in his estimation from the consciousness i had of having sunk two if not three pegs in my own this was a galling thought to me but it was not the only one which disturbed me happily or unhappily i have as much heart as pride and lucetta's despair and the desperate resolve to which it had led had made an impression upon me which i could not shake off whether she knew the criminal or only suspected him whether in the heat of her sudden anguish she had promised more or less than she could perform the fact remained that we by whom i mean first and above all mr gryce the ablest detective on the new york force and myself who if no detective am at least a factor of more or less importance in an inquiry like this were awaiting the action of a weak and suffering girl to discover what our own experience should be able to obtain for us unassisted that mr gryce felt that he was playing a great card in thus enlisting her despair in our service did not comfort me i am not fond of games in which real hearts take the place of painted ones and besides i was not ready to acknowledge that my own capacity for ferreting out this mystery was quite exhausted or that I ought to remain idle while Lucetta bent under a task so much beyond her strength. So deeply was I impressed by this latter consideration that I found myself, even in the midst of my apparent interest in what was going on at Mother Jane's cottage, asking if I was bound to accept the defeat pronounced upon my efforts by Mr. Grice, and if there was not yet time to retrieve myself and save lucetta one happy thought or clever linking of cause to effect might lead me yet to the clue which we had hitherto sought in vain and then who would have more right to triumph than amelia butterworth or who more reason to apologize than ebenezer gryce but where was i to get my happy thought and by what stroke of fortune could i reasonably hope to light upon a clue which had escaped the penetrating eye of my quondam colleague lucetta's gesture and lucetta's exclamation he passed that way indicated that her suspicions pointed in the direction of deacon spear's cottage so did william's wandering accusations but this was little help to me confined as i was to the knollis domain both by mr gryce's command and by my own sense of propriety no i must light on something more tangible something practical enough to justify me in my own eyes for any interference i might meditate in short i must start from a fact and not from a suspicion but what fact why there was but one and that was the finding of certain indisputable tokens of crime in mother jane's keeping that was a clue a clue to be sure which mr gryce while ostensibly following it in his present action really felt to lead nowhere but which i here my thoughts paused i dare not promise myself too satisfactory results to my efforts even while conscious of that vague elation which presages success and which i could only overcome by resorting again to reasoning this time i started with a question had mother jane committed these crimes herself i did not think so neither did mr gryce for all the persistence he showed in having the ground about her humble dwelling-place turned over 
then how had the ring of mr chittenden come to be in her possession when as all agreed she never was known to wander more than forty rods away from home if the crime by which this young gentleman had perished had taken place up the road as lucetta's denouncing finger plainly indicated then this token of mother jane's complicity in it had been carried across the intervening space by other means than mother jane herself in other words it was brought to her by the perpetrator or it was placed where she could lay hand on it neither supposition implying guilt on her part she being in all probability as innocent of wrong as she was of sense at all events such should be my theory for the nonce old theories having exploded or become of little avail in the present aspect of things to discover then the source of crime i must discover the means by which this ring reached mother jane an almost hopeless task but not to be despaired of on that account had i not wrung the truth in times gone by from that piece of obstinate stolidity the van burnham scrub woman and if i could do this might i not hope to win an equal confidence from this half demented creature with a heart so passionate it beat to but one tune her lizzie i meant at least to try and under the impulse of this resolve i left my position at the gate and recrossed the road to mother jane whose figure i could dimly discern on the farther side of her little house mr gryce barely looked up as i passed him and the men not at all they were deep in their work and probably did not see me neither did mother jane at first she had not yet wearied of the shining gold she held though she had begun again upon that chanting of numbers the secret of which mr gryce had discovered in his investigation of her house i therefore found it hard to make her hear me when i attempted to speak she had fixed upon the new number fifteen and seemed never to tire of repeating it at last i took cue from her speech and shouted out the word ten it was the number of the vegetable in which mr chittenden's ring had been hidden and it made her start violently ten ten i reiterated catching her eye he who brought it has carried it away come into the house and look it was a desperate attempt i felt myself quake inwardly as i realized how near mr gryce was standing and what his anger would be if he surprised me at this move after he had cried halt but neither my own perturbation nor the thought of his possible anger could restrain the spirit of investigation which had returned to me with the above words and when i saw that they had not fallen upon deaf ears but that mother jane heard and in a measure understood them i led the way into the hut and pointed to the string from which the one precious vegetable had been torn she gave a spring toward it that was well-nigh maniacal in its fury and for an instant i thought she was going to rend the air with one of her wild yells when there came a swishing of wings at one of the open windows and a dove flew in and nestled in her breast diverting her attention so that she dropped the empty husk of the onion she had just grasped and seized the bird in its stead it was a violent clutch so violent that the poor dove panted and struggled under it till its head flopped over and i looked to see it die in her hands stop i cried horrified at a sight i was so unprepared to expect from one who was supposed to cherish these birds most tenderly but she heard me no more than she saw the gesture of indignant appeal i made her all her attention as well as all her fury was fixed upon the dove over whose neck and under whose wings she ran her trembling fingers with the desperation of one looking for something he failed to find ten ten 
it was now her turn to shout as her eyes passed in angry menace from the bird to the empty husk that dangled over her head you brought it did you and you've taken it have you there then you'll never bring or carry any more and lifting up her hand she flung the bird to the other side of the room and would have turned upon me in which contingency i would for once have met my match if in releasing the bird from her hands she had not at the same time released the coin which she had hitherto managed to hold through all her passionate gestures the sight of this piece of gold which she had evidently forgotten for the moment turned her thoughts back to the joys it promised her recapturing it once more she sank again into her old ecstasy upon which i proceeded to pick up the poor senseless dove and leave the hut with a devout feeling of gratitude for my undoubted escape that i did this quietly and with the dove hidden under my little cape no one who knows me well will doubt i had brought something from the hut besides this victim of the old imbecile's fury and i was no more willing that mr gryce should see the one than detect the other i had brought away a clue the birds of the air shall carry it so the scripture runs this bird this pigeon who now lay panting out his life in my arms had brought her the ring which in mr gryce's eyes had seemed to connect her with the disappearance of young mr chittenden end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain an hour of startling experiences not till i was safely back in the knollis grounds not indeed till i had put one or two large and healthy shrubs between me and a certain pair of very prying eyes did i bring the dove out from under my cape and examine the poor bird for any sign which might be of help to me in the search to which i was newly committed but i found nothing and was obliged to resort to my old plan of reasoning to make anything out of the situation in which i thus so unexpectedly found myself the dove had brought the ring into old mother jane's hands but whence and through whose agency this was as much a secret as before but the longer i contemplated it the more i realized that it need not remain a secret long that we had simply to watch the other doves note where they lighted and in whose barn doors they were welcome for us to draw inferences that might lead to revelations before the day was out if deacon spear but deacon spear's house had been examined as well as that of every other resident in the lane this i knew but it had not been examined by me and unwilling as i was to challenge the accuracy or thoroughness of a search led on by such a man as mr gryce i could not but feel that with such a hint as i had received from the episode in the hut it would be a great relief to my mind to submit these same premises to my own somewhat penetrating survey no man in my judgment having the same quickness of eyesight in matters domestic as a woman trained to know every inch of a house and to measure by a hair's breadth every fall of drapery within it but how in the name of goodness was i to obtain an opportunity for this survey had we not one and all been bidden to confine our attention to what was going on in mother jane's cottage and would it not be treason to lucetta to run the least risk of awakening apprehension in any possibly guilty mind at the other end of the road yes but for all that i could not keep still if fate or my own ingenuity 
offered me the least chance of pursuing the clue i had wrung from our imbecile neighbour at the risk of my life it was not in my nature to do so any more than it was in my nature to yield up my present advantage to mr gryce without making a personal effort to utilize it i forgot that i failed in this once before in my career or rather i recalled this failure perhaps and felt the great need of retrieving myself when therefore in my slow stroll towards the house i encountered william in the shrubbery i could not forbear accosting him with a question or two william i remarked gently rubbing the side of my nose with an irresolute forefinger and looking at him from under my lids that was a scurvy trick you played deacon spear yesterday he stood amazed then burst into one of his loud laughs you think so he cried well i don't he only got what he deserved the hard sanctimonious sneak do you say that i inquired with some spirit because you dislike the man or because you really believe him to be worthy of hatred william's amusement at this argued little for my hopes we are very much interested in the deacon he suggested with a leer which insolence i allowed to pass unnoticed because it best suited my plan you have not answered my question i remarked with a forced air of anxiety oh no he cried so i haven't and he tried to look serious too well well to be just i have nothing really against the man but his mean ways still if i were going to risk my life on a hazard as to who is the evil spirit of this lane i should say spear and done with it he has such cursed small eyes i don't think his eyes are too small i returned loftily then with a sudden change of manner i suggested anxiously and my opinion is shared by your sisters they evidently think very well of him oh he sneered girls are no judges they don't know a good man when they see him and they don't know a bad you mustn't go by what they say i had it on the tip of my tongue to ask if he did not think lucetta sufficiently understood herself to be trusted in what she contemplated doing that night but this was neither in accordance with my plan nor did it seem quite loyal to lucetta who so far as i knew had not communicated her intentions to this booby brother i therefore changed this question into a repetition of my first remark well i still think the trick you played deacon spear yesterday a poor one and i advise you as a gentleman to go and ask his pardon this was such a preposterous proposition he could not hold his peace i ask his pardon he snorted well saracen did you ever hear the like of that i ask deacon spear's pardon for obliging him to be treated with as great attention as i had been myself if you do not i went on unmoved i shall go and do it myself i think that is what my friendship for you warrants i am determined that while i am a visitor in your house no one shall be able to pick a flaw in your conduct he stared as he might well do tried to read my face then my intentions and failing to do both which was not strange broke into noisy mirth oh ho he laughed so that is your game is it well i never saracen miss butterworth wants to reform me wants to make one of her sleek city chaps out of william knollys she'll have hard work of it won't she but then we're beginning to like her well enough to let her try miss butterworth i'll go with you to deacon spear i haven't had so much chance for fun in a twelvemonth i had not expected such success and was duly thankful but i made no reference to it aloud on the contrary i took his complaisance as a matter of course and hiding all token of triumph 
suggested quietly that we should make as little ado as possible over our errand seeing that mr gryce was something of a meddler and might take it into his head to interfere which suggestion had all the effect i anticipated for at the double prospect of amusing himself at the deacon's expense and of outwitting the man whose business it was to outwit us he became not only willing but eager to undertake the adventure offered him so with the understanding that i was to be ready to drive into town as soon as he could hitch up the horse we parted on the most amicable terms he proceeding towards the stable and i towards the house where i hoped to learn something new about lucetta but loreen from whom alone i could hope to glean any information was shut in her room and did not come out though i called her more than once which if it left my curiosity unsatisfied at least allowed me to quit the house without awakening hers william was waiting for me at the gate when i descended he was in the best of humours and helped me into the buggy he had resurrected from some corner of the old stable with a grimace of suppressed mirth which argued well for the peace of our proposed drive the horse's head was turned away from the quarter we were bound for but as we were ostensibly on our way to the village this showed but common prudence on william's part and as such met with my entire approbation mr gryce and his men were hard at work when we passed them knowing the detective so well and rating at its full value his undoubted talent for reading the motives of those about him i made no attempt at cajolery in the explanation i proffered of our sudden departure but merely said in my old peremptory way that i found waiting at the gate so tedious that i had accepted william's invitation to drive into town which while it astonished the old gentleman did not really arouse his suspicions as a more conciliatory manner and speech might have done this disposed of we drove rapidly away william's sense of humour once aroused was not easily allayed he seemed so pleased with his errand that he could talk of nothing else and turned the subject over and over in his clumsy way till i began to wonder if he had seen through the object of our proposed visit and was making me the butt of his none too brilliant wit but no he was really amused at the part he was called upon to play and once convinced of this i let his humour run on without check till we had re-entered lost man's lane from the other end and were in sight of the low sloping roof of deacon spear's old-fashioned farmhouse then i thought it time to speak william said i deacon spear is too good a man and as i take it is in possession of too great worldly advantages for you to be at enmity with him remember that he is a neighbour and that you are a landed proprietor in this lane good for you was the elegant reply with which this young boar honoured me i didn't think you had such an eye for the main chance deacon spear is rich is he not i pursued with an ulterior motive he was far from suspecting rich why i don't know that depends upon what you city ladies call rich i shouldn't call him so but then as you say i am a landed proprietor myself his laugh was boisterously loud and as we were then nearly in front of the deacon's house it rang in through the open windows causing such surprise that more than one head bobbed up from within to see who dared to laugh like that in lost man's lane while i noted these heads and various other small matters about the house and place william tied up the horse and held out his hand for me to descend i begin to suspect he whispered as he helped me out why you are so anxious to have me on good terms with the deacon at which insinuation i attempted to smile but only succeeded in forcing a grim twitch or two to my lips for at that moment and before i could take one step towards the house 
a couple of pigeons rose up from behind the house and flew away in a bee-line for mother jane's cottage ha thought i my instinct has not failed me behold the link between this house and the hut in which those tokens of crime were found and was for the moment so overwhelmed by this confirmation of my secret suspicions that i quite forgot to advance and stood stupidly staring after these birds now rapidly disappearing in the distance william's voice aroused me come he cried don't be bashful i don't think much of deacon spear myself but if you do why what's the matter now he asked with a startled look at me i had clutched him by the arm nothing i protested only you see that window over there the one in the gable of the barn i mean i thought i saw a hand thrust out a white hand that dropped crumbs have they a child on this place no replied william in an odd voice and with an odd look toward the window i have mentioned did you really see a hand there i most certainly did i answered with an air of indifference i was far from feeling someone is up in the hayloft perhaps it is deacon spear himself if so he will have to come down for now that we are here i am determined you shall do your duty deacon spear can't climb that hayloft was the perplexed answer i received in a hardly intelligible mutter i've been there and i know only a boy or a very agile young man could crawl along the beams that lead to that window it is the one hiding place in this part of the lane and when i said yesterday that if i were the police and had the same search to make which they have i knew where i would look i meant that same little platform up behind the hay whose only outlook is yonder window but i forgot that you have no suspicions of our good deacon that you are here on quite a different errand than to search for silly rufus so come along and but i resisted his impelling hand he was so much in earnest and so evidently under the excitement of what appeared to him a great discovery that he seemed quite another man this made my own suspicions less hazardous and also added to the situation fresh difficulties which could only be met by an appearance on my part of perfect ingenuousness turning back to the buggy as if i had forgotten something and thus accounting to any one who might be watching us for the delay we showed in entering the house i said to william you have reasons for thinking this man a villain or you wouldn't be so ready to suspect him now what if i should tell you that i agree with you and that this is why i have dragged you here this fine morning i should say you were a deuced smart woman was his ready answer but what can you do here what have we already done i asked discovered that they have someone in hiding in what you call an inaccessible place in the barn but didn't the police examine the whole place yesterday they certainly told me they had searched the premises thoroughly yes he repeated with great disdain they said and they said but they didn't climb up to the one hiding place in sight that old fellow grice declared it wasn't worth their while that only birds could reach that loophole oh i returned somewhat taken aback you called his attention to it then to which william answered with a vigorous nod and the grumbling words i don't believe in the police i think they're often in league with the very rogues they but here the necessity of approaching the house became too apparent for further delay deacon spear had shown himself at the front door and the sight of his astonished face twisted into a grimace of doubtful welcome drove every other thought away than how we were to acquit ourselves in the coming interview seeing that william was more or less nonplussed by the situation i caught him by the arm and whispering let us keep to our first program led him up the walk with much the air of a triumphant captain bringing in a recalcitrant prisoner 
my introduction under these circumstances can be imagined by those who have followed william's awkward ways but the deacon who was probably the most surprised if not the most disconcerted member of the group possessed a natural fund of conceit and self-complacency that prevented any outward manifestation of his feelings though i could not help detecting a carefully suppressed antagonism in his eye when he allowed it to fall upon william which warned me to exercise my full arts in the manipulation of the matter before me i accordingly spoke first and with all the prim courtesy such a man might naturally expect from an intruder of my sex and appearance deacon spear said i as soon as we were seated in his stiff old-fashioned parlour you are astonished to see us here no doubt especially after the display of animosity shown towards you yesterday by this graceless young friend of mine but it is on account of this unfortunate occurrence that we are here after a little reflection and a few hints i may add from one who has seen more of life than himself william felt that he had cause to be ashamed of himself for his show of sport in yesterday's proceedings and accordingly he has come in my company to tender his apologies and entreat your forbearance am i not right william the fellow is a clown under all and every circumstance and serious as our real purpose was and dreadful as was the suspicion he professed to cherish against the suave and seemingly respectable member of the community we were addressing he could not help laughing as he blunderingly replied that you are miss butterworth she's always right deacon i did act like a fool yesterday and seeming to think that with this one sentence he had played his part out to perfection he jumped up and strolled out of the house almost pushing down as he did so the two daughters of the house who had crept into the hall from the sitting-room to listen well well exclaimed the deacon you have done wonders miss butterworth to bring him to even so small an acknowledgment as that he's a vicious one is william knollys and if i were not such a lover of peace and concord he should not long be the only aggressive one but i have no taste for strife and so you may both regard his apology as accepted but why do you rise madam sit down i pray and let me do the honours martha jemima but i would not allow him to summon his daughters the man inspired me with too much dislike if not fear besides i was anxious about william what was he doing and of what blunder might he not be guilty without my judicious guidance i am obliged to you i returned but i cannot wait to meet your daughters now another time deacon there is important business going on at the other end of the lane and william's presence there may be required ah he observed following me to the door they are digging up mother jane's garden i nodded restraining myself with difficulty fool's work he muttered then with a curious look which made me instinctively draw back he added these things must inconvenience you madam i wish you had made your visit to the lane in happier times there was a smirk on his face which made him positively repellent i could scarcely bow my acknowledgments his look and attitude made the interview so obnoxious looking about for william i stepped down from the stoop the deacon followed me where is william i asked the deacon ran his eye over the place and suddenly frowned with ill-concealed vexation the scapegrace he murmured what business has he in my barn i immediately forced a smile which in days long past i've almost forgotten them now used to do some execution oh he's a boy i exclaimed do not mind his pranks i pray what a comfortable place you have here instantly a change passed over the deacon and he turned to me with an air of great interest 
broken now and then by an uneasy glance behind him at the barn. "'I am glad you like the place,' he insinuated, keeping close at my side as I stepped somewhat briskly down the walk. "'It is a nice place, worthy of the commendation of so competent a judge as yourself.' It was a barren, hard-worked farm without one attractive feature. I have lived on it now forty years, thirty-two of them with my beloved wife Caroline, and two... Here he stopped and wiped a tear from the driest eye I ever saw. Miss Butterworth, I am a widower. I hastened my steps. I hear duly and with the strictest regard for the truth aver that i decidedly hastened my steps at this very unnecessary announcement but he with another covert glance behind him towards the barn from which to my surprise and increasing anxiety william had not yet emerged kept well up to me and only paused when i paused at the side of the road near the buggy "'Miss Butterworth,' he began, undeterred by the air of dignity I assumed, "'I have been thinking that your visit here is a rebuke to my unneighbourliness, "'but the business which has occupied the lane these last few days "'has put us all into such a state of unpleasantness "'that it was useless to attempt sociability.' "'His voice was so smooth, his eyes so small and twinkling, that if I could have thought of anything except William's possible discoveries in the barn, I should have taken delight in measuring my wits against his egotism. But as it was, I said nothing, possibly because I only half heard what he was saying. I am no ladies' man, these were the next words I heard, but then I judge you're not anxious for flattery but prefer the square thing uttered by a square man, without delay or circumlocution. Madam, I am fifty-three, and I have been a widower two years. I am not fitted for a solitary life, and I am fitted for the companionship of an affectionate wife, who will keep my hearth clean and my affections in good working order. Will you be that wife? You see my home. Here his eye stole behind him with that uneasy look towards the barn which William's presence in it certainly warranted. A home which I can offer you unencumbered if you desire to live in Lost Man's Lane, I put in, subduing both my surprise and my disgust at this preposterous proposal in order to throw all the sarcasm of which I was capable into this single sentence. Oh, he exclaimed, you don't like the neighbourhood. Well, we could go elsewhere. I am not set against the city myself. Astounded at his presumption, regarding him as a possible criminal, who was endeavouring to beguile me for purposes of his own, I could no longer repress either my indignation or the wrath with which such impromptu addresses naturally inspired me. Cutting him short with a gesture which made him open his small eyes, I exclaimed in continuation of his remark, "'Nor, as I take it, are you set against the comfortable little income somebody has told you I possessed. I see your disinterestedness, Deacon, but I should be sorry to profit by it. Why, man, I never spoke to you before in my life, and do you think—' Oh, he suavely insinuated, with a suppressed chuckle which even his increasing uneasiness as to William could not altogether repress, I see you are not above the flattery that pleases other women. Well, madam, I know a tremendous fine woman when I see her, and from the moment I saw you riding by the other day, I made up my mind I would have you for the second Mrs. Spear if persistence and a proper advocacy of my cause could accomplish it. Madam, I was going to visit you with this proposal to-night, but seeing you here, the temptation was too great for my discretion, and so I have addressed you on the spot. But you need not answer me at once. I don't need to know any more about you 
than what I can take in with my two eyes. But if you would like a little more acquaintance with me, why, I can wait a couple of weeks till we've rubbed the edges off our strangeness, when, when you think I will be so charmed with Deacon Spear that I will be ready to settle down with him in Lost Man's Lane, or if that will not do, carry him off to Gramercy Park, where he will be the admiration of all New York and Brooklyn to boot. Why, man, if I was so easily satisfied as that, I would not be in a position today for you to honour me with this proposal. I am not easy to suit, so I advise you to turn your attention to someone much more anxious to be married than I am. But, and here I allowed some of my real feelings to appear, if you value your own reputation, or the happiness of the lady you propose to inveigle into a union with you, do not venture too far in the matrimonial way, till the mystery is dispelled which shrouds Lost Man's Lane in horror. If you were an honest man, you would ask no one to share your fortunes, whilst the least doubt rests upon your reputation. My reputation? He had started very visibly at these words. Madam, be careful. I admire you, but... No offence, said I. For a stranger I have been perhaps unduly frank. I only mean that any one who lives in this lane must feel himself more or less enveloped by the shadow which rests upon it. When that is lifted, each and every one of you will feel himself a man again. From indications to be seen in the lane today, that time may not be far distant. Mother Jane is a likely source for the mysteries that agitate us. She knows just enough to have no proper idea of the value of a human life. The deacon's retort was instantaneous. Madam, said he, with a snap of his fingers, I have not that much interest in what is going on down there. If men have been killed in this lane, which I do not believe, old Mother Jane has had no hand in it. My opinion is, and you may value it or not, just as you please, that what the people hereabout call crimes are so many coincidences, which some day or other will receive their due explanation. Every one who has disappeared in this vicinity has disappeared naturally. No one has been killed. That is my theory, and you will find it correct. On this point, I have expended more than a little thought. I was irate. I was also dumbfounded at his audacity. Did he think I was the woman to be deceived by any such balder dash as that? But I shut my lips tightly, lest I should say something, and he, not finding this agreeable, being no conversationalist himself, drew himself up with a pompously expressed hope that he would see me again after his reputation was cleared, when his attention, as well as my own, was diverted by seeing William's slouching figure appear in the barn door and make slowly towards us. Instantly the deacon forgot me in his interest in William's approach, which was so slow as to be tantalising to us both. When he was within speaking distance, Deacon Spear started towards him. Well, he cried, one would think you had gone back a dozen or so years and were again robbing your neighbour's hen roosts. Been in the hay, eh? he added, leaning forward and plucking a wisp or two from my companion's clothes. Well, what did you find there? In trembling fear for what the lout might answer, I put my hand on the buggy rail and struggled anxiously to my seat. William stepped forward and loosened the horse before speaking. Then, with a leer, he dived into his pocket, and remarking slowly, I found this, brought to light a small riding whip, which we both recognised as one he often carried. I flung it up in the hay yesterday in one of my fits of laughing, so just thought I would bring it down today. You know it isn't the first time I've climbed about those rafters, Deacon, as you have been good enough to insinuate. The Deacon, evidently taken aback, 
eyed the young fellow with a leer in which i saw something more serious than mere suspicion was that all he began but evidently thought better than to finish whilst william with a nonchalance that surprised me blunderingly avoided his eye and bounding into the buggy beside me started up the horse and drove slowly off ta-da deacon he called back if you want to see fun come up to our end of the lane there's precious little here and thus with a laugh terminated an interview which all things considered was the most exciting as well as the most humiliating i have ever taken part in william i began but stopped the two pigeons whose departure i had watched a little while before were coming back and as i spoke fluttered up to the window before mentioned where they alighted and began picking up the crumbs which i had seen scattered for them see i suddenly exclaimed pointing them out to william was i mistaken when i thought i saw a hand drop crumbs from that window the answer was a very grave one for him no said he for i have seen more than a hand through the loophole i made in the hay i saw a man's leg stretched out as if he were lying on the floor with his head toward the window it was but a glimpse i got but the leg moved as i looked at it and so i know that some one lies hid in that little nook up under the roof now it isn't any one belonging to the lane for i know where every one of us is or ought to be at this blessed moment and it isn't a detective for i heard a sound like heavy sobbing as i crouched there then who is it silly rufus i say and if that hay was all lifted we would see sights that would make us ashamed of the apologies we uttered to the old sneak just now i want to get home said i drive fast your sisters ought to know this the girls he cried yes it will be a triumph over them they never would believe i had an atom of judgment but we'll show them if william knollys is altogether a fool we were now near to mr trome's hospitable gateway coming from the excitements of my late interview it was a relief to perceive the genial owner of this beautiful place wandering among his vines and testing the condition of his fruit by a careful touch here and there as he heard our wheels he turned and seeing who we were threw up his hands in ill-restrained pleasure and came buoyantly forward there was nothing to do but to stop so we stopped why william why miss butterworth what a pleasure such was his amiable greeting i thought you were all busy at your end of the lane but i see you have just come from town had an errand there i suppose yes william grumbled eyeing the luscious pear mr trome held in his hand the look drew a smile from that gentleman admiring the first fruits he observed well it is a handsome specimen he admitted handing it to me with his own peculiar grace i beg you will take it miss butterworth you look tired pardon me if i mention it he is the only person i know who detects any signs of suffering or fatigue on my part i am worried by the mysteries of this lane i ventured to remark i hate to see mother jane's garden uprooted ah he acquiesced with much evidence of good feeling it is a distressing thing to witness i wish she might have been spared william there are other pears on the tree this came from tie up the horse i pray and gather a dozen or so of these for your sisters they will never be in better condition for plucking than they are to-day william whose mouth and eyes were both watering for a taste of the fine fruit thus offered moved with alacrity to obey this invitation while i more startled than pleased or rather as much startled as pleased by the prospect of a momentary tete-a-tete -tete with our agreeable neighbour sat uneasily eyeing the luscious fruit in my hand and wishing i was ten years younger that the blush i felt slowly stealing up my cheek might seem more appropriate to the occasion 
but mr trome appeared not to share my wish he was evidently so satisfied with me as i was that he found it difficult to speak at first and when he did but tut tut you have no desire to hear any such confidences as these i am sure a middle-aged gentleman's expressions of admiration for a middle-aged lady may savour of romance to her but hardly to the rest of the world so i will pass this conversation by with the single admission that it ended in a question to which i felt obliged to return a reluctant no mr trome was just recovering from the disappointment of this when william sauntered back with his hands and pockets full ah that graceless scamp chuckled with a suspicious look at our downcast faces been improving the opportunity eh mr trome who had fallen back against his old well curb surveyed his young neighbour for the first time with a look of anger but it vanished almost as quickly as it appeared and he contented himself with a low bow in which i read real grief this was too much for me and i was about to open my lips with a kind phrase or two when a flutter took place over our heads and the two pigeons whose flight i had watched more than once during the last hour flew down and settled upon mr trome's arms and shoulders oh i exclaimed with a sudden shrinking that i hardly understood myself and though i covered up the exclamation with as brisk a good-bye as my inward perturbation would allow that sight and the involuntary ejaculation i had uttered were all i saw or heard during our hasty drive homeward End of chapter 36chapter thirty seven of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain i astonish mr gryce and he astonishes me but as we approached the group of curious people which now filled up the whole highway in front of mother jane's cottage i broke from the nightmare into which this last discovery had thrown me and turning to william said with a resolute air you and your sisters are not of one mind regarding these disappearances you ascribe them to deacon spear but they whom do they ascribe them to i shouldn't think it would take a woman of your wit to answer that question the rebuke was deserved i had wit but i had refused to exercise it my blind partiality for a man of pleasing exterior and magnetic address had prevented the cool play of my usual judgment due to the occasion and the trust which had been imposed in me by mr gryce resolved that this should end no matter at what cost to my feelings i quietly said you allude to mr trome that is the name he carelessly assented girls you know let their prejudices run away with them an old grudge yes i tentatively put in he persecuted your mother and so they think him capable of any wickedness the growl which william gave was not one of dissent but i don't care what they think said he looking down at the heap of fruit which lay between us i'm trome's friend and don't believe one word they choose to insinuate against him what if he didn't like what my mother did we didn't like it either and william i calmly remarked if your sisters knew that silly rufus had been found in deacon spear's barn they would no longer do mr trome this injustice no that would settle them that would give me a triumph which would last long after this matter was out of the way very well then said i i am going to bring about this triumph i am going to tell mr gryce at once what we have discovered in deacon spear's barn and without waiting for his ah yes or no 
I jumped from the buggy and made my way to the detective's side. His welcome was somewhat unexpected. Ah, fresh news, he exclaimed. I see it in your eye. What have you chanced upon, madam, in your disinterested drive into town? I thought I had eliminated all expression from my face, and that my words would bring a certain surprise with them. But it is useless to try to surprise Mr. Grice. You read me like a book, said I. I have something to add to the situation. Mr. Grice, I have just come from the other end of the lane, where I found a clue which may shorten the suspense of this weary day, and possibly save Lucetta from the painful task she has undertaken in our interests. Mr. Chittenden's ring... I paused for the exclamation of encouragement he is accustomed to give on such occasions, and while I paused, prepared for my accustomed triumph. He did not fail me in the exclamation, nor did I miss my expected triumph. Was not found by Mother Jane, or even brought to her in any ordinary way or by any ordinary messenger, it came to her on a pigeon's neck, the pigeon you will find lying dead among the bushes in the Knollis yard. He was amazed. He controlled himself, but he was very visibly amazed. His exclamations proved it. Madam, Miss Butterworth, this ring, Mr. Chittenden's ring, whose presence in her hut we thought an evidence of guilt, was brought to her by one of her pigeons so she told me i aroused her fury by showing her the empty husk in which it had been concealed in her rage at its loss she revealed the fact i have just mentioned it is a curious one sir and one i am a little proud to have discovered curious it is more than curious it is bizarre and will rank, I am safe in prophesying, as one of the most remarkable facts that have ever adorned the annals of the police. Madam, when I say I envy you the honour of its discovery, you will appreciate my estimate of it, and you. But when did you find this out, and what explanation are you able to give of the presence of this ring on a pigeon's neck? sir to your first question i need only reply that i was here two hours or so ago and to the second that everything points to the fact that the ring was attached to the bird by the victim himself as an appeal for succour to whoever might be fortunate enough to find it unhappily it fell into the wrong hands that is the ill luck which often befalls prisoners prisoners yes cannot you imagine a person shut up in an inaccessible place making some such attempt to communicate with his fellow creatures but what inaccessible place have we in wait said i you have been in deacon spear's barn certainly many times but the answer glib as it was showed shock i began to gather courage well said i there is a hiding place in that barn which i dare declare you have not penetrated do you think so madam a little loft way up under the eaves which can only be reached by clambering over the rafters didn't deacon spear tell you there was such a place no but william then i inexorably pursued he says he pointed such a spot out to you, and that you pooh-poohed at it as inaccessible and not worth the searching. William is a... Madam, I beg your pardon, but William has just wit enough to make trouble. But there is such a place there, I urged, and, what is more, there is someone hidden in it now. I saw him myself you saw him saw a part of him in short saw his hand he was engaged in scattering crumbs for the pigeons that does not look like starvation smiled mr grice with the first hint of sarcasm he had allowed himself to make use of in this interview 
No, said I, but the time may not have come to inflict this penalty on silly Rufus. He has been there but a few days, and, well, what have I said now? Nothing, ma'am, nothing. But what made you think the hand you saw belonged to silly Rufus? Because he was the last person to disappear from this lane, the last... What am I saying? He wasn't the last. Lucetta's lover was the last. Mr. Grice, could that hand have belonged to Mr. Ostrander? I was intensely excited, so much so that Mr. Grice made me a warning gesture. Hush, he whispered, you are attracting attention. That hand was the hand of Mr. Ostrander, and the reason why I did not accept William Knollys's suggestion to search the deacon's barn loft was because I knew it had been chosen as a place of refuge by this missing lover of Lucetta. End of chapter 37「Thirty Eight of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A few words. Never have keener or more conflicting emotions been awakened in my breast than by these simple words. But alive to the necessity of hiding my feelings from those about me, I gave no token of my surprise but rather turned a stonier face than common upon the man who had caused it. Refuge, I repeated. He is there, then, of his own free will, or yours, I sarcastically added, not being able to quite keep down this reproach as I remembered the deception practised upon Lucetta. Mr. Ostrander, madam, has been spending the week with Deacon Spear, they are old friends, you know. That he should spend it quietly, and to a degree in hiding, was as much his plan as mine. For while he found it impossible to leave Lucetta in the doubtful position in which she and her family at present stand, he did not wish to aggravate her misery by the thought that he was thus jeopardising the position on which all his hopes of future advancement depended. He preferred to watch and wait in secret, seeing which I did what I could to further his wishes. His usual lodging was with the family, but when the search was instituted, I suggested that he should remove himself to that eerie back of the hay, where you were sharp enough to detect him to-day. Don't attempt any of your flatteries upon me, I protested. They will not make me forget that I have not been treated fairly. And Lucetta, oh, may I not tell Lucetta, and spoil our entire prospect of solving this mystery? No, madam, you may not tell Lucetta. When fate has put such a card into our hands as I played with that telegram to-day, we would be flying in the face of providence not to profit by it. Lucetta's despair makes her bold. Upon that boldness we depend to discover and bring to justice a great criminal. I felt myself turn pale. For that very reason, perhaps, I assumed a still sterner air and composedly said, If Mr. Ostrander is in hiding at the deacon's, and he and his host are both in your confidence, then the only man whom you can designate in your thoughts by this dreadful title must be Mr. Trome. I had perhaps hoped he would recoil at this, or give some other evidence of his amazement at an assumption which to me seemed preposterous, but he did not, and I saw, with what feelings may be imagined, that this conclusion, which was half bravado with me, had been accepted by him long enough for no emotion to follow its utterance. Oh, I exclaimed, how can you reconcile such a suspicion with the attitude you have always preserved towards Mr. Trome? Madam, said he, 
do not criticise my attitude without taking into account existing appearances they are undoubtedly in mr trome's favour i am glad to hear you say so said i i am glad to hear you say so why it was in response to his appeal that you came to x at all mr gryce's smile conveyed a reproach which i could not but acknowledge i amply merited had he spent evening after evening at my house entertaining me with tales of the devices and the many inconsistencies of criminals to be met now by such a puerile disclaimer as this but beyond that smile he said nothing on the contrary he continued as if i had not spoken at all but appearances he declared will not stand before the insight of a girl like lucetta she has marked the man as guilty and we will give her the opportunity of proving the correctness of her instinct but mr trome's house has been searched and you have found nothing nothing i argued somewhat feebly that is the reason we find ourselves forced to yield our judgment to lucetta's intuitions was his quick reply and smiling upon me with his blandest air he obligingly added miss butterworth is a woman of too much character not to abide the event with all her accustomed composure and with this final suggestion i was as yet too crushed to resent he dismissed me to an afternoon of unparalleled suspense and many contradictory emotions End of chapter 38「UNDER A CRIMSON SKY」When, in the course of events, the current of my thoughts receive a decided check, and I find myself forced to change former conclusions, or habituate myself to new ideas and a fresh standpoint, I do it as i do everything else with determination and a total disregard of my own previous predilections before the afternoon was well over i was ready for any revelations which might follow lucetta's contemplated action merely reserving a vague hope that my judgment would yet be found superior to her instinct at five o'clock the diggers began to go home nothing had been found under the soil of mother jane's garden and the excitement of search which had animated them early in the day had given place to a dull resentment mainly directed towards the knollis family if one could judge of these men's feelings by the heavy scowls and significant gestures with which they passed our broken-down gateway by six the last man had filed by leaving mr gryce free for the work which lay before him i had retired long before this to my room where i awaited the hour set by lucetta with a feverish impatience quite new to me as none of us could eat the supper-table had not been laid and though i had no means of knowing what was in store for us the sombre silence and oppression under which the whole house lay seemed a portent that was by no means encouraging suddenly i heard a knock at my door rising hastily i opened it laurine stood before me with parted lips and terror in all her looks come she cried come and see what i have found in lucetta's room then she's gone i cried yes she's gone but come and see what she has left behind her hastening after laurine who was by this time halfway down the hall i soon found myself on the threshold of the room i knew to be lucetta's she made me promise cried laurine halting to look back at me that i would let her go alone and that i would not enter the highway till an hour after her departure but with these evidences of the extent of her dread before us how can we stay in this house 
and dragging me to a table she showed me lying on its top a folded paper and two letters the folded paper was lucetta's will and the letters were directed severally to loreen and to myself with the injunction that they were not to be read till she had been gone six hours she has prepared herself for death i exclaimed shocked to my heart's core but determinedly hiding it but you need not fear any such event is she not accompanied by mr gryce i do not know i do not think so how could she accomplish her task if not alone miss butterworth miss butterworth she has gone to brave mr trome our mother's persecutor and our lifelong enemy thinking hoping believing that in so doing she will rouse his criminal instincts if he has them and so lead to the discovery of his crimes and the means by which he has been enabled to carry them out so long undetected it is noble it is heroic it is martyr-like but oh miss butterworth i have never broken a promise to any one before in all my life but i am going to break the one i made her come let us fly after her she has her lover's memory but i have nothing in all the world but her i immediately turned and hastened down the stairs in a state of humiliation which should have made ample amends for any show of arrogance i may have indulged in in my more fortunate moments loreen followed me and when we were in the lower hall she gave me a look and said my promise was not to enter the highway would you be afraid to follow me by another road a secret road all overgrown with thistles and blackberry bushes which have not been trimmed up for years i thought of my thin shoes my neat silk dress but only to forget them the next moment i will go anywhere said i but loreen was already too far in advance of me to answer she was young and lithe and had reached the kitchen before i had passed the flower parlour but when we had sped clear of the house i found that my progress bade fare to be as rapid as hers for her agitation was a hindrance to her while excitement always brings out my powers and heightens both my wits and my judgment our way lay past the stables from which i expected every minute to see two or three dogs jump but william who had been discreetly sent out of the way early in the afternoon had taken saracen with him and possibly the rest so our passing by disturbed nothing not even ourselves the next moment we were in a field of prickers through which we both struggled till we came into a sort of swamp here was bad going but we floundered on edging continually toward a distant fence beyond which rose the symmetrical lines of an orchard mr trome's orchard in which those pleasant fruits grew which bah should i ever be able to get the taste of them out of my mouth at a tiny gateway covered with vines loreen stopped i do not believe this has been opened for years but it must be opened now and throwing her whole weight against it she burst it through and bidding me pass hastened after me over the trailing branches and made without a word for the winding path we now saw clearly defined on the edge of the orchard before us oh exclaimed loreen stopping one moment to catch her breath i do not know what i fear or to what our steps will bring us i only know that i must hunt for lucetta till i find her if there is danger where she is i must share it you can rest here or come farther on i went farther on suddenly we both started a man had sprung up from behind the hedgerow that ran parallel with the fence that surrounded mr trome's place silence he whispered putting his finger on his lips if you are looking for miss knollys he added seeing us both pause aghast 
she is on the lawn beyond talking to mr trome if you will step here you can see her she is in no kind of danger but if she were mr gryce is in the first row of trees to the back there and a call from me that made me remember my whistle it was still round my neck but my hand which had instinctively gone to it fell again in extraordinary emotion as i realized the situation and compared it with that of the morning when blinded by egotism and foolish prejudice in favour of this man i ate of his fruit and hearkened to his outrageous addresses come beckoned loreen happily too absorbed in her own emotions to notice mine let us get nearer if mr trome is the wicked man we fear there is no telling what the means are which he uses to get rid of his victims there was nothing to be found in his house but who knows where the danger may lurk and that it may not be near her now it was evidently to dare it she came to offer herself as a martyr that we might know hush i whispered controlling my own fears roused against my will by this display of terror in this usually calmest of natures no danger can menace her where they stand unless he is a common assassin and carries a pistol no pistol murmured the man who had crept again near us pistols make a noise he will not use a pistol good god i whispered you do not share her sister's fears that it is in the heart of this man to kill lucetta five strong men have disappeared hereabout said the fellow never moving his eye from the couple before us why not one weak girl with a cry loreen started forward run she whispered run but as the word left her lips a slight movement took place in the belt of trees where we had been told mr gryce lay in hiding and we could see him issue for a moment into sight with his finger like that of his man laid warningly on his lips loreen trembled and drew back seeing which the man beside us pointed to the hedge and whispered softly there is just room between it and the fence for a person to pass sideways if you and this lady want to get nearer to miss knollys you might take that road but mr gryce will expect you to be very quiet the young lady expressly said before she came into this place that she could do nothing if for any reason mr trome should suspect they were not alone we will be quiet i assured him anxious to hide my face which i felt twitch at every mention of mr trome's name loreen was already behind the hedge the evening was one of those which are made for peace the sun which had set in crimson had left a glow on the branches of the forest which had not yet faded into the grey of twilight the lawn around which we were skirting had not lost the mellow brilliancy which made it sparkle nor had the cluster of varied hued hollyhocks which set their gorgeousness against the neat yellow of the peaceful doorposts shown any dimness in their glory which was on a par with that of the setting sun but though i saw all this it no longer appeared to me desirable lucetta and lucetta's fate the mystery and the impossibility of its being explained out here in the midst of turf and blossoms filled all my thoughts and made me forget my own secret cause for shame and humiliation loreen who had wormed her way along till she crouched nearly opposite to the place where her sister stood plucked me by the gown as i approached her and pointing to the hedge which pressed up so close it nearly touched our faces seemed to bid me look through searching for a spot where there was a small opening i put my eye to this and immediately drew back they are moving nearer the gate i signalled to loreen at which she crept along a few paces 
but with a stealth so great that alert as i was i could not hear a twig snap i endeavoured to imitate her but not with as much success as i could wish the sense of horror which had all at once settled upon me the supernatural dread of something which i could not see but which i felt had seized me for the first time and made the ruddy sky and the broad stretch of velvet turf with the shadows playing over it of swaying tree-tops and clustered oleanders more thrilling and awesome to me than the dim halls of the haunted house of the knollis family in that midnight hour when i saw a body carried out for burial amid trouble and hush and a mystery so great it would have daunted most spirits for the remainder of their lives the very sweetness of the scene made its horror never have i had such sensations never have i felt so deeply the power of the unseen yet it seemed so impossible that anything could happen here anything which would explain the total disappearance of several persons at different times without a trace of their fate being left to the eye that i could but liken my state to that of nightmare where visions take the place of realities and often overwhelm them i had pressed too close against the hedge as i struggled with these feelings and the sound i made struck me as distinct if not alarming but the tree-tops were rustling overhead and while lucetta might have heard the hedge branches crack her companion gave no evidence of doing so we could distinguish what they were saying now and realizing this we stopped moving and gave our whole attention to listening mr trome was speaking i could hardly believe it was his voice it had so changed in tone nor could i perceive in his features distorted as they now were by every evil passion the once quiet and dignified countenance which had so lately imposed upon me lucetta my little lucetta he was saying so she has come to see me come to taunt me with the loss of her lover whom she says i have robbed her of almost before her eyes i rob her how can i rob her or any one of a man with a voice and arm of his own stronger than mine am i a wizard to dissipate his body in vapour yet can you find it in my house or on my lawn you are a fool lucetta so are all these men about here fools it is in your house hush she cried her slight figure rising till we forgot it was the feeble lucetta we were gazing at no more accusations directed against us it is you who must expect them now mr trome your evil practices are discovered to-morrow you will have the police here in earnest they did but play with you when they were here before you child he gasped striving however to restrain all evidences of shock and terror why who was it called in the police and set them working in lost man's lane was it not i yes that they might not suspect you and perhaps that they might suspect us but it was useless obadiah trome althea knollis's children have been long suffering but the limit of their forbearance has been reached when you laid your hand upon my lover you roused a spirit in me that nothing but your own destruction can satisfy where is he mr trome and where is silly rufus and all the rest who have vanished between deacon spear's house and the little home of the cripples on the high road they have asked me this question but if any one in lost man's lane can answer it is you persecutor of my mother and traducer of ourselves whom i here denounce in face of these skies where god reigns and this earth where man lives to harry and condemn and then i saw that the instinct of this girl 
had accomplished what our united acumen and skill had failed to do the old man indeed he seemed an old man now cringed and the wrinkles came out in his face till he was demoniacally ugly you viper he shrieked how dare you accuse me of crime you whose mother would have died in jail but for my forbearance have you ever seen me set my foot upon a worm look at my fruit and flowers look at my home without a spot or blemish to mar its neatness and propriety can a man who loves these things stomach the destruction of a man much less of a silly yawping boy lucetta you are mad mad or sane my accusation will have its results mr trome i believe too deeply in your guilt not to make others do so ah said he then you have not done so yet you believe this and that but you have not told any one what your suspicions are no she calmly returned though her face blanched to the colourlessness of wax i have not said what i think of you yet oh the cunning that crept into his face she has not said oh the little lucetta the wise the careful little lucetta but i will she cried meeting his eye with the courage and constancy of a martyr though i bring destruction upon myself i will denounce you and do it before the night has settled down upon us i have a lover to avenge a brother to defend besides the earth should be rid of such a monster as you such a monster as i well my pretty one his voice grown suddenly wheedling his face a study of mingled passions we will see about that come just a step nearer lucetta i want to see if you are really the little girl i used to dandle on my knee they were now near the gateway they had been moving all this time his hand was on the curb of the old well his face so turned that it caught the full glare of the setting sun leaned toward the girl exerting a fascinating influence upon her she took the step he asked and before we could shriek out beware we saw him bend forward with a sudden quick motion and then start upright again while her form which but an instant before had stood there in all its frail and inspired beauty tottered as if the ground were bending under it and in another moment disappeared from our appalled sight swallowed in some dreadful cavern that for an instant yawned in the smoothly cut lawn before us and then vanished again from sight as if it had never been a shriek from my whistle mingled with a simultaneous cry of agony from loreen we heard mr gryce rush from behind us but we ourselves found it impossible to stir paralyzed as we were by the sight of the old man's demoniacal delight he was leaping to and fro over the turf holding up his fingers in the red sunset glare six he shrieked six and room for two more oh it's a merry life i lead flowers and fruit and love-making oh how i cringed at that and now and then a little spice like this but where is my pretty lucetta surely she was here a moment ago how could she have vanished then so quickly i do not see her form amid the trees there is no trace of her presence upon the lawn and if they search the house from top to bottom and from bottom to top they will find nothing of her no not so much as a print of her footstep or the scent of the violets she so often wears tucked into her hair these last words uttered in a different voice from the rest gave the clue to the whole situation 
we saw even while we all bounded forward to the rescue of the devoted maiden that he was one of those maniacs who have perfect control over themselves and pass for very decent sort of men except in the moment of triumph and noting his look of sinister delight perceived that half his pleasure and almost his sole reward for the horrible crimes he had perpetrated was in the mystery surrounding his victims and the entire immunity from suspicion which up to this time he had enjoyed meantime mr gryce had covered the wretch with his pistol and his man who succeeded in reaching the place even sooner than ourselves hampered as we were by the almost impenetrable hedge behind which we had crouched tried to lift the grass-covered lid we could faintly discern there but this was impossible until i with almost superhuman self-possession considering the imperative nature of the emergency found the spring hidden in the well curb which worked the deadly mechanism a yell from the writhing creature cowering under the detective's pistol guided me unconsciously in its action and in another moment we saw the fatal lid tip and disclose what appeared to be the remains of a second well long ago dried up and abandoned for the other the rescue of lucetta followed as she had fainted in falling she had not suffered much and soon we had the supreme delight of seeing her eyes unclose ah she murmured in a voice whose echo pierced to every heart save that of the guilty wretch now lying handcuffed on the sward i thought i saw albert he was not dead and i but here mr gryce with an air at once contrite and yet strangely triumphant interposed his benevolent face between hers and her weeping sisters and whispered something in her ear which turned her pallid cheek to a glowing scarlet rising up she threw her arms around his neck and let him lift her as he carried her where was his rheumatism now out of those baleful grounds and away from the reach of the maniac's mingled laughs and cries her face was peace itself but his well his was a study End of chapter 39「Explanations」The hour we all spent together late that night in the old house was unlike any hour which that place had seen for years. Mr. Ostrander, Lucetta, Laureen, William, Mr. Grice, and myself, all were there, and as an especial grace, Saracen was allowed to enter, that there might not be a cloud upon a single face there assembled. Though it is a small matter, I will add that this dog persisted in lying down by my side, not yielding even to the wiles of his master, whose amusement over this fact kept him good-natured to the last adieu. There were too few candles in the house to make it bright, but Lucetta's unearthly beauty, the peace in Laureen's soft eyes, made us forget the sombreness of our surroundings and the meagreness of the entertainment Hannah attempted to offer us. It was the promise of coming joy, and when our two guests departed, I bade good night to the girls in their grim upper hall. It was with feelings which found their best expression in the two letters I hastened to write as soon as I gained the refuge of my own apartment. I will admit you sufficiently into my confidence to let you read those letters. The first of them ran thus. Dear Olive, to make others happy is the best way to forget our own misfortunes a sudden wedding is to take place in this house 
order at once for me from the shops you know me to be in the habit of patronising a wedding gown of dainty white taffeta i did this not to recall too painfully to herself the wedding dress i helped her buy and which was as you may remember of creamy satin with chiffon trimmings and a wedding veil of tulle add to this a dress suitable for ocean travel and a half dozen costumes adapted to a southern climate let everything be suitable for a delicate but spirited girl who has seen trouble but who is going to be happy now if a little attention and money can make her so do not spare expense yet show no extravagance for she is a shy bird easily frightened the measurements you will find enclosed also those of another young lady her sister who must also be supplied with a white dress the material of which however had better be of crepe all these things must be here by wednesday evening my own best dress included on saturday evening you may look for my return i shall bring the latter young lady with me so your present loneliness will be forgotten in the pleasure of entertaining an agreeable guest faithfully yours amelia butterworth the second letter was a longer and more important one it was directed to the president of the company which had proposed to send mr ostrander to south america in it i related enough of the circumstances which had kept mr ostrander in x to interest him in the young couple personally and then i told him that if he would forgive mr ostrander this delay and allow him to sail with his young bride by the next steamer i myself would undertake to advance whatever sums might have been lost by this change of arrangement i did not know then that mr gryce had already made this matter good with this same gentleman the next morning we all took a walk in the lane i say nothing about the night if i did not choose to sleep or if i had any cause not to feel quite as elevated in spirit as the young people about me there is surely no reason why i should dwell upon it with you or even apologize for a weakness which you will regard i hope as an exception setting off my customary strength now a walk in this lane was an event to feel at liberty to stroll among its shadows without fear to know that the danger had been so located that we all felt free to inhale the autumn air and to enjoy the beauties of the place without a thought of peril lurking in its sweetest nooks and most attractive coverts gave to this short half-hour a distinctive delight aptly expressed by Lorene when she said, I never knew the place was so beautiful. Why, I think I can be happy here now. At which Lucetta grew pensive, till I roused her by saying, So much for a constitutional girls. Now we must to work. This house, as you see it now, has to be prepared for a wedding. William, your business will be to see that these grounds are put in as good order as possible in the short time allotted to you. I will bear the expense. And Lorene, but William had a word to say for himself. Miss Butterworth, said he, you're a right good sort of woman, as Saracen has found out, and we too, in these last few plaguey days. But I'm not such a bad lot either and if i do like my own way which may not be other people's way and if i am sometimes short with the girls for some of their damned nonsense i have a little decency about me too and i promise to fix these grounds and out of my own money too now that nine-tenths of our income does not have to go abroad we'll have chink enough to let us live in a respectable manner once more in a place where one horse if he's good enough will give a fellow a standing and make him the envy of those who for some other pesky reasons may think themselves called upon to fight shy of him i don't begrudge the old place a few dollars especially as i mean to live and die in it 
So look out, you three women folks, and work as lively as you can on the inside of the old rookery, or the slickness of the outside will put you to open shame, and that would never please Laureen, nor, as I take it, Miss Butterworth either. It was a challenge we were glad to accept, especially as from the number of persons we now saw come flocking into the lane, it was very apparent that we should experience no further difficulty in obtaining any help we might need to carry out our undertakings. Meantime, my thoughts were not altogether concentrated upon these pleasing plans for Lucetta's benefit. There were certain points yet to be made clear in the matter just terminated, and there was a confession for me to make, without which I could not face Mr. Grice with all that unwavering composure which our peculiar relations seemed to demand. The explanations came first. They were volunteered by Mr. Grice, whom I met in the course of the morning at Mother Jane's cottage. That old crone had been perfectly happy all night, sleeping with the coin in her hand, and waking to again devour it with her greedy but loving eyes. As I was alternately watching her and Mr. Grice, who was directing with his hand the movements of the men, who had come to smooth down her garden and make it presentable again, the detective spoke. I suppose you have found it difficult, in the light of these new discoveries, to explain to yourself how Mother Jane happened to have those trinkets from the peddler's pack, and also how the ring, which you very naturally thought must have been entrusted to the dove by Mr. Chittenden himself, came to be about its neck when it flew home that day of Mr. Chittenden's disappearance. Madam, we think old Mother Jane must have helped herself out of the peddler's pack before it was found in the woods there back of her hut. And of the other matter, our explanation is this. One day a young man, equipped for travelling, paused for a glass of water at the famous well in Mr. Trome's garden, just as Mother Jane's pigeons were picking up the corn scattered for them by the former, whose tastes are not confined to the cultivation of fruits and flowers, but extend to dumb animals, to whom he is uniformly kind. The young man wore a ring, and being nervous, was fiddling with it as he talked to the pleasant old gentleman, who was lowering the bucket for him. As he fiddled with it, the earth fell from under him, and as the daylight vanished above his head, the ring flew from his upthrown hand, and lay the only token of his now blotted out existence upon the emerald sward he had but a moment before pressed with his unsuspicious feet. It burned, this ruby burned like a drop of blood in the grass, when that demon came again to his senses, and being a tell-tale evidence of crime in the eyes of one who had allowed nothing to ever speak against him in these matters, he stared at it as at a deadly thing directed against himself, and to be got rid of at once, and by means which by no possibility could recoil back upon himself as its author. The pigeons, stalking near, offered to his abnormally acute understanding the only solution which would leave him absolutely devoid of fear. He might have swung open the lid of the well once more, and flung it after its owner, but this meant an aftermath of experience from which he shrank, his delight being in the thought that the victims he saw vanish before his eyes were so many encumbrances wiped off the face of the earth by a sweep of the hand. To see or hear them again would be destructive of this notion. He preferred the subtler way, and to take advantage of old Mother Jane's characteristics, so he caught one of the pigeons, he has always been able to lure birds into his hands, and tying the ring around the neck of the bird with a blade of grass plucked up from the highway, he let it fly, and so was rid of the bauble, which to Mother Jane's eyes, of course, was a direct gift from the heavens through which the bird had flown before lighting on her doorstep. Wonderful! I exclaimed, 
almost overwhelmed with humiliation, but preserving a brave front. What invention, and what audacity! The invention and the audacity of a man totally irresponsible for his deeds, was it not? I asked. There is no doubt, is there, about his being an absolute maniac? No, madam. What a relief I felt at that word. Since we entrapped him yesterday, and he found himself fully discovered, he has lost all grip upon himself, and fills the room we put him in with the unmistakable ravings of a madman. It was through these I learned the facts I have just mentioned. I drew a deep breath. We were standing in the sight of several men, and their presence there seemed intolerable. Unconsciously I began to walk away. Unconsciously Mr. Grice followed me. At the end of several paces we both stopped. We were no longer visible to the crowd, and I felt I could speak the words I had been burning to say ever since I saw the true nature of Mr. Trome's character exposed. Mr. Grice, said I, flushing scarlet, which I hear solemnly declare is something which has not happened to me before in years, and if I can help it shall never happen to me again. I am interested in what you say, because yesterday, at his own gateway, Mr. Trome proposed to me, and— You did not accept him? No. What do you think I am made of, Mr. Grice? I did not accept him. But I made the refusal a gentle one, and— This is not easy work, Mr. Grice. I interrupted myself to say with suitable grimness. The same thing took place between me and Deacon Spear, and to him I gave a response such as I thought his presumption warranted. The discrimination does not argue well for my astuteness, Mr. Grice. You see, I crave no credit that I do not deserve. Perhaps you cannot understand that but it is a part of my nature. Madam, said he, and I must own, I thought his conduct perfect. Had I not been as completely deceived as yourself, I might find words of criticism for this possibly unprofessional partiality. But when an old hand like myself can listen to the insinuations of a maniac, and repose, as I must say I did repose, more or less confidence in the statements he chose to make me, and which were true enough as to the facts he mentioned, but wickedly false and preposterously wrong in suggestion, I can have no words of blame for a woman who, whatever her understanding and whatever her experience, necessarily has seen less of human nature and its incalculable surprises. As to the more delicate matter you have been good enough to confide to me, madam, I have but one remark to make. With such an example of womanhood, suddenly brought to their notice, in such a wild as this, how could you expect them, sane or insane, to do otherwise than they did? I know many a worthy man who would like to follow their example." and with a bow that left me speechless, Mr. Grice laid his hand on his heart and softly withdrew. End of chapter 40from an old diary of Althea Knollys, found by me in the packet left in my charge by her daughter Lucetta. I never thought I should do so foolish a thing as begin a diary. When in my boarding school days, which I am very glad to be rid of, I used to see Mealy Butterworth sit down every night of her life over a little book which she called the repository of her daily actions, 
i thought that if ever i reached that point of imbecility i would deserve to have fewer lovers and more sense just as she so frequently advised me to and yet here i am pencil in hand jotting down the nothings of the moment and with every prospect of continuing to do so for two weeks at least for why was i born such a chatterbox i have seen my fate and must talk to some one about him if only to myself nature never having meant me to keep silence on any living topic that interests me yes with lovers in boston lovers in new york and a most determined suitor on the other side of our own home walls in peekskill i have fallen victim to the grave face and methodical ways of a person i need not name since he is the only gentleman in this whole town except but i won't except anybody charles knollys has no peer here or anywhere and this i am ready to declare after only one sight of his face and one look from his eye though to no one but you my secret non-committal confidant for to acknowledge to any human being that my admiration could be caught or my heart touched by a person who had not sued two years at my feet would be to abdicate an ascendancy i am so accustomed to i could not see it vanish without pain besides who knows how i shall feel to-morrow mealy butterworth never shows any hesitation in uttering her opinion either of men or things but then her opinion never changes whilst mine is a very thistle-down blowing hither and thither till i cannot follow its wanderings myself it is one of my charms certain fools say but that is nonsense if my cheeks lacked colour and my eyes were without sparkle or even if i were two inches taller instead of being the tiniest bit of mortal flesh to be found amongst all the young ladies of my age in our so-called society i doubt if the lightness of my mind would meet with the approbation of even the warmest woman lovers of this time as it is it just passes and sometimes as to-night for instance when i can hardly see to inscribe these lines on this page for the vision of two grave if not quietly reproving eyes which float between it and me i almost wish i had some of mealy's responsible characteristics instead of being the airiest merriest and most volatile being that ever tried to laugh down the grandeur of this dreary old house with its century of memories ah that allusion has given me something to say this house what is there about it except its size to make a stranger like me look back continually over her shoulder in going down the long halls or even when nestling comfortably by the great wood fire in the immense drawing-room i am not one of your fanciful ones but i can no more help doing this than i can help wishing judge knollys lived in a less roomy mansion with fewer echoing corners in its innumerable passages i like brightness and cheer at least in my surroundings if i must have gloom or a seriousness which some would call gloom let me have it in individuals where there is some prospect of a blithe careless-hearted little midget effecting a change and not in great towering walls and endless floors which no amount of sunshine or laughter could ever render home-like or even comfortable but there if one has the man one must have the home so i had better say no more against the home till i am quite sure i do not want the man for well well i am not a fool but i did hear something just then a something which makes me tremble yet though i have spent five good minutes trilling the gayest songs i know i think it is very inconsiderate of the witches to bother thus a harmless mite like myself who only asks for love light 
and money enough to buy a ribbon or a jewel when the fancy takes her, which is not as often as my enemies declare. And now a question. Why are my enemies always to be found among the girls, and among the plainest of them too? I never heard a man say anything against me, though I have sometimes surprised a look on their faces, I saw it to-day, which might signify reproof if it were not accompanied by a smile showing anything but displeasure. But this is a digression, as Mealy would say. What I want to do, but which I seem to find it very difficult to do, is to tell how I came to be here, and what I have seen since I came. First, then, to be very short about the matter, I am here because the old folks, that is, my father and Mr. Knollys, have decided Charles and I should know each other. In thought, I curtsy to the decision. I think we ought to, too. For while many other men are handsomer or better known, or have more money, alas, than he, he alone has a way of drawing up to one side with an air that captivates the eye and sets the heart trembling. A heart, moreover, that never knew before it could tremble, except in the presence of great worldly prosperity and beautiful, beautiful things. So, as this experience is new, I am dutifully obliged for the excitement it gives me, and am glad to be here, awesome as the place is, and destitute of any such pleasures as I have been accustomed to in the gay cities where I have hitherto spent most of my time. But there I am rambling again. I have come to X, as you now see, for good and sufficient reasons, and while this house is one of consequence, and has been the resort of many notable people, it is a little lonesome, our only neighbour being a young man who has a fine enough appearance, but who has already shown his admiration of me so plainly, of course he was in the road when I drove up to the house, that I lost all interest in him at once, such a nonsensical liking at first sight, being, as I take it, a tribute only to my audacious little travelling bonnet, and the curl or two which will fall out on my cheek when I move my head about too quickly, as I certainly could not be blamed for doing, in driving into a place where I was expected to make myself happy for two weeks. He, then, is out of these chronicles. When I say his name is Obadiah Trome, you will probably be duly thankful but he is not as stiff and biblical as his name would lead you to expect. On the contrary, he is lithe, graceful, and suave to a point which makes Charles Knollys's judicial face a positive relief to the eye, and such little understanding as has been accorded me. I cannot write another word. It is twelve o'clock, and though I have the cosiest room in the house, all chintz and decorated china, I find myself listening and peering just as I did downstairs in their great barn of a drawing-room. I wonder if any very dreadful things ever happened in this house. I will ask old Mr. Knollys tomorrow, or, or Mr. Charles. I am sorry I was so inquisitive, for the stories Charles told me I thought I had better not trouble the old gentleman, have only served to people the shadows of this rambling old house with figures of whose acquaintance I am likely to be more or less shy. One tale in particular gave me the shivers. It was about a mother and daughter who both loved the same man. It seems incredible, girls so seldom seeing with the eyes of their mothers. And it was the daughter who married him while the mother, broken-hearted, fled from the wedding, and was driven up to the great door here, in a coach, dead. They say that the coach still travels the road just before some calamity to the family, a phantom coach which floats along in shadow, 
turning the air about it to mist that chills the marrow in the bones of the unfortunate who sees it i am going to see it myself some day the real coach i mean in which this tragic event took place it is still in the stable charles tells me i wonder if i will have the courage to sit where that poor devoted mother breathed out her miserable existence i shall endeavour to do so if only to defy the fate which seems to be closing in upon me charles is an able lawyer but his argument in favour of close bonnets versus bewitching little pokes with a rose or two in front was very weak i thought to-day he seemed to think so himself after a while for when as the only means of convincing him of the weakness of the cause he was advocating i ran upstairs and put on a poke similar to the aforesaid he retracted at once and let the case go by default for which i and the poke made suitable acknowledgments to the great amusement of papa knollys who was on my side from the first not much going on to-day yet i have never felt merrier oh ye hideous bare old walls won't i make you ring if i won't have it i won't have that smooth persistent hypocrite pushing his way into my presence when my whole heart and attention belong to a man who would love me if he only could get his own leave to do so obadiah trome has been here to-day on one pretext or another three times once he came to bring some very choice apples as if i cared for apples the second time he had a question of great importance no doubt to put to charles and as charles was in my company the whole interview lasted let us say a good half hour at least the third time he came it was to see me which as it was now evening meant talk 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 in the great drawing-room with just a song interpolated now and then instead of a cosy chat in the window-seat of the pretty flower-parlour with only one pair of ears to please and one pair of eyes to watch master trome was intrusive and if no one felt it but myself it is because charles knollys has set himself up an ideal of womanhood to which i am a contradiction but that will not affect the end a woman may be such a contradiction and yet win if her heart is in the struggle and she has besides a certain individuality of her own which appeals to the eye and heart if not to the understanding i do not despair of seeing charles knollys's forehead taking a very deep frown at sight of his handsome and most attentive neighbour hey ho why don't i answer mealy butterworth's last letter am i ashamed to tell her that i have to limit my effusion to just four pages because i have commenced a diary i declare i begin to regard it a misfortune to have dimples i never have regarded it so before when i have seen man after man succumb to them but now they have become my bane for they attract two admirers just at the time they should attract but one and it is upon the wrong man they flash the oftenest why i leave it to all true lovers to explain as a consequence master trome is beginning to assume an air of superiority and charles who may not believe in dimples but who on that very account perhaps seems to be always on the lookout for them shrinks more or less into the background as is not becoming in a man with so many claims to respect if not to love i want to feel that each one of these precious fourteen days contains all that it can of delight and satisfaction and how can i when obadiah oh the charming and romantic name holds my cruels instead of charles and whispers words which coming from other lips would do more than waken my dimples but if i must have a suitor 
just when a suitor is not wanted let me at least make him useful charles shall read his own heart in this man's passion i don't know why but i have taken a dislike to the flower parlour it now vies with the great drawing-room in my disregard yesterday in crossing it i felt a chill so sudden and so penetrating that i irresistibly thought of the old saying some one is walking over my grave my grave where lies it and why should i feel the shudder of it now am i destined to an early death the bounding life in my veins says no but i never again shall like that room it has made me think i have not only sat in the old coach but i had let me drop the words slowly they are so precious i i have had a kiss given me there charles gave me this kiss he could not help it i was sitting on the seat in front in a sort of mock mirth he was endeavouring to frown upon when suddenly i glanced up and our eyes met and he says it was the sauciness of my dimples oh those old dimples they seem to have stood me in good stead after all but i say it was my sincere affection which drew him for he stooped like a man forgetful of everything in the whole wide world but the little trembling panting being before him and gave me one of those caresses which seals a woman's fate for ever and made me the feather-brained and thoughtless coquette a slave to this large-minded and true-hearted man for all my life hereafter why i should be so happy over this event is beyond my understanding that he should be in the seventh heaven of delight is only to be expected but that i should find myself tripping through this gloomy old house like one treading on air is a mystery to the elucidation of which i can only give my dimples my reason can make nothing out of it i who thought of nothing short of a grand establishment in boston money servants and a husband who would love me blindly whatever my faults have given my troth you will say my lips but the one means the other to a man who will never be known outside of his own county never be rich never be blind even for he frowns upon me as often as he smiles and worst of all who lives in a house so vast and so full of tragic suggestion that it might well awaken doleful anticipations in much more serious-minded persons than myself and yet i am happy so happy that i have even attempted to make the acquaintance of the grim old portraits and weak pastels which line the walls of many of these bedrooms old mr knollys caught me curtsying just now before one of these ancestral beauties whose face seemed to hold a faint prophecy of my own and perceiving by my blushes that this was something more than a mere childish freak on my part he chucked me under the chin and laughingly asked how long it was likely to be before he might have the honour of adding my pretty face to the collection which should have made me indignant only i am not in an indignant mood just now why have i been so foolish why did i not let my over-fond neighbour know from the beginning that i detested him instead of but what have i done anyway a smile a nod a laughing word mean nothing when one has eyes which persist in dancing in spite of one's every effort to keep them demure men who become fools are apt to call one a coquette when a little good sense would teach them that the woman who smiles always has some other way of showing her regard to the man she really favours i could not help being on merry terms with mr trome if only to hide the effect another's presence has on me but he thinks otherwise 
and to-day i had ample reason for seeing why his good looks and easy manners have invariably awakened distrust in me rather than admiration master trome is vindictive and i should be afraid of him if i had not observed in him the presence of another passion which will soon engross all his attention and make him forget me as soon as ever i become charles's wife money is his idol and as fortune seems to favour him he will soon be happy in the mere pleasure of accumulation but this is not relating what happened to-day we were walking in the shrubbery by we i naturally mean charles and myself and he was saying things which made me at the same time happy and a bit serious when i suddenly felt myself under the spell of some baleful influence that filled me with a dismay i could neither understand nor escape from as this could not proceed from charles i turned to look about me when i encountered the eyes of obadiah trome who was leaning on the fence separating his grounds from those of mr knollys looking directly at us if i flinched at this surveillance it was but the natural expression of my indignation his face wore a look calculated to frighten any one and though he did not respond to the gesture i made him i felt that my only chance of escaping a scene was to induce charles to leave me before he should see what i saw in the lowering countenance of his intrusive neighbour as the situation demanded self-possession and the exercise of a ready wit and as these are qualities in which i am not altogether deficient i succeeded in carrying out my intention sooner even than i expected charles hurried from my presence at the first word and proceeded towards the house without seeing trome and i quivering with dread turned towards the man whom i felt rather than saw approaching me he met me with a look i shall never forget i have had lovers too many of them and this is not the first man i have been compelled to meet with rebuff and disdain but never in the whole course of my none too extended existence have i been confronted by such passion or overwhelmed with such bitter recrimination he seemed like a man beside himself yet he was quiet too quiet and while his voice did not rise above a whisper and he approached no nearer than the demands of courtesy required he produced so terrifying an effect upon me that i longed to cry for help and would have done so but that my throat closed with fright and i could only gurgle forth a remonstrance too faint even for him to hear you have played with a man's best feelings he said you have led me to believe that i had only to speak to have you for my own are you simply foolish or are you wicked did you care for me at all or was it only your wish to increase the number of men in your train this one here his hand pointed quiveringly towards the house has enjoyed a happiness denied me his hand has touched yours his lips here his words became almost unintelligible till his purpose gave him strength and he cried but notwithstanding this notwithstanding any vows you may have exchanged i have claims upon you that i will not yield i who have loved no woman before you will have such a hand in your fate that you will never be able to separate yourself from the influence i shall exert over you i will not intrude between you and your lover i will not affect dislike or disturb your outer life with any vain display of my hatred or my passion but i will work upon your secret thoughts and create a slowly increasing dread in the inner sanctuary of your heart till you wish you had called up the deadliest of serpents in your pathway rather than the latent fury of obadiah trome 
you are a girl now when you are married and become a mother you will understand me for the present i leave you the shadow of this old house which has never seen much happiness within it will soon rest upon your thoughtless head what that will not do your own inherent weakness will the woman who trifles with a strong man's heart has a flaw in her nature which will work out her own destruction in time i can afford to let you enjoy your prospective honeymoon in peace afterwards he cast a threatening look towards the decaying structure behind me and was silent but that silence did not unloose my tongue i was absolutely speechless ten brides have crossed yonder threshold he presently went on in a low musing tone freighted with horrible fatality one and she was the girl whose mother was driven up to these doors dead lived to take her grandchildren on her knees the rest died early and most of them unhappily oh i have studied the traditions of your future home you will live but of all the brides who have triumphed in the honourable name of knollys you will lead the saddest life and meet the gloomiest end notwithstanding you stand before me now with loose locks flying in the wind and a heart so gay that even my despair can barely pale the roses on your cheek this was the raving of a madman i recognised it as such and took a little heart how could he see into my future how could he prophesy evil to one over whom he will have no control to one watched over and beloved by a man like charles he is a dreamer a fanatic his talk about the flaw in my nature is nonsense and as for the fate lowering over my head in the shadows falling from the toppling old house in which i am likely to take up my abode that is only frenzy and i would be unworthy of happiness to heed it as i realised this my indignation grew and uttering a few contemptuous words i was hurrying away when he stopped me with a final warning wait he said women like you cannot keep either their joys or their miseries to themselves but i advise you not to take charles knollys into your confidence if you do a duel will follow and if i have not the legal acumen of your intended i have an eye and a hand before which he must fall if our passions come to an issue so beware never while you live betray what has passed between us at this interview unless the weariness of a misplaced affection should come to you and with it the desire to be rid of your husband a frightful threat which unfortunately perhaps has sealed my lips oh why should such monsters live I have been all through the house today with old Mr. Knollys. Every room was opened for my inspection, and I was bidden to choose which should be refurnished for my benefit. It was a gruesome trip, from which I have returned to my own little nook of chintz as to a refuge. Great rooms, which for years have been the abode of spiders, are not much to my liking but i chose out two which at least have fireplaces in them and these are to be made as cheerful as circumstances will permit i hope when i again see them it will not be by the light of a waning november afternoon when the few leaves still left to flutter from the trees blow soggy and wet against the panes of the solitary windows or lie in sodden masses at the foot of the bare trunks which cluster so thickly on the lawn as to hide all view of the high road i was meant for laughter and joy flashing lights and the splendours of ballrooms why have i chosen then to give up the great world 
and settle down in this grimmest of grim old houses in a none too lively village i think it is because i love charles knollys and so no matter how my heart sinks in the dim shadows that haunt every spot i stray into i will be merry will think of charles instead of myself and so live down the unhappy prophecies uttered by the wretch who with his venomous words has robbed the future of whatever charm my love was likely to cast upon it the fact that this man left the town to-day for a lengthy trip abroad should raise my spirits more than it has if we were going now charles and i but why dream of a paradise whose doors remain closed to you it is here our honeymoon is destined to be passed within these walls and in sight of the bare boughs rattling at this moment against the panes i made a misstatement when i said that i had gone into all the rooms of the house this afternoon i did not enter the flower parlour i had been married a month and had as i thought no further use for this foolish diary so one evening when charles was away i attempted to burn it but when i had flung myself down before the blazing logs of my bedroom fire i was then young enough to love to crouch for hours on the rug in my lonely room seeking for all i delighted in and longed for in the glowing embers some instinct or was it a premonition made me withhold from destruction a record which coming events might make worthy of preservation that was five years ago and to-day i have reopened the secret drawer in which this simple book has so long lain undisturbed and am once more penning lines destined perhaps to pass into oblivion together with the others why i do not know there is no change in my married life i have no trouble no anxiety no reason for dread yet well well some women are made for the simple round of domestic duties and others are as out of place in the nursery and kitchen as butterflies in a granary i want just the things charles cannot give me i have home love children all that some women most crave and while i idolize my husband and know of nothing sweeter than my babies i yet have spells of such wretched weariness that it would be a relief to me to be a little less comfortable if only i might enjoy a more brilliant existence but charles is not rich sometimes i think he is poor and however much i may desire change i cannot have it hey ho and what is worse i haven't had a new dress in a year i who so love dress and become it so well why if it is my lot to go shabby and tie up my dancing ringlets with faded ribbons was i made with the figure of a fairy and given a temperament which without any effort on my part makes me diminutive as i am the centre of every group i enter if i were plain or shy or even self-contained i might be happy here but now there there i will go kiss little william and lay Lorene's baby arm about my neck and see if the wicked demons will fly away charles is too busy for me to intrude upon him in that horrid flower parlour i was never superstitious till i entered this house but now i believe in every sort of thing a sane woman should not yesterday after a neglect of five years i brought out my diary to-day i have to record in it that there was a reason for my doing so obadiah trome has returned home i saw him this morning leaning over his fence in the same place and in very much the same attitude as on that day when he frightened me so a month before my wedding but he did not frighten me to-day he merely looked at me very sharply 
and with a less offensive admiration than in the early days of our first acquaintance at which i made him my best curtsy i was not going to remind him of the past in our new relations and he thankful perhaps for this took off his hat with a smile i am trying even yet to explain to myself then we began to talk he had travelled everywhere and i had been nowhere he wore the dress and displayed the manners of the great world while i had only a hungry desire to do the same as for fashion i needed all my beauty and the fading sparkle of my old animation to enable me to hold up my head before him but as for liking him i did not i could admire his appearance but he himself attracted me no more than when he had words of angry fury on his tongue he is a gentleman and one who has seen the world but in other ways he is no more to be compared with my charles than his pert new house built in his absence with the grand old structure with whose fatality he once threatened me i do not think he wants to threaten me with disaster now time closes such wounds as his very effectually i wish we had some of his money i have always heard that the wives of the nullis whatever their misfortune have always loved their husbands i do not think i am any exception to the rule when charles has leisure to give me an hour from his musty old books the place here seems lively enough and the children's voices do not sound so shrill but these hours are so infrequent if it were not for mr trome's journal did i mention that he had lent me a journal of his travels i should often eat my heart out with loneliness i am beginning to like the man better as i follow him from city to city of the old world if he had ever mentioned me in its pages i would not read another line in it but he seems to have expended both his love and spite when he bade me farewell in the garden underlying these bleak old walls i am becoming as well acquainted with mr trome's handwriting as with my own i read and read and read in his journal and only stop when the dreaded midnight hour comes with its ghostly suggestions and the unaccountable noises which make this old dwelling so uncanny charles often finds me curled up over this book and when he does he sighs why i have been teaching Lorene to dance oh how merry it has made me i think i will be happier now we have the large upper hall to take steps in and when she makes a misstep we laugh and that is a good sound to hear in this old place if i could only have a little money to buy her a fresh frock and some ribbons i would feel perfectly satisfied but i do believe charles is getting poorer and poorer every day the place costs so much to keep up he says and when his father died there were debts to be paid which leaves us his innocent inheritors very straitened master trome has no such difficulties he has money enough but i don't like the man for all that polite as he is to us all he seems to quite adore loreen and as to william he pets him till i feel almost uncomfortable at times what shall i do i am invited to new york i and charles says i may go too only i have nothing to wear oh for some money a little money it is my right to have some money but charles tells me he can only spare enough to pay my expenses that my sunday frock looks very well and that even if it did not i am pretty enough to do without fine clothes and other nonsense like that sweet enough but totally without point in fact if i am pretty all the more i need a little finery to set me off and besides to go to new york without money why i should be perfectly miserable charles himself ought to realize this 
and be willing to sell his old books before he would let me go into this whirl of temptation without a dollar to spend as he don't i must devise some plan of my own for obtaining a little money for i won't give up my trip the first offered me since i was married and neither will i go away and come back without a gift for my two girls who have grown to womanhood without a jewel to adorn them or a silk dress to make them look like gentlemen's children but how get money without charles knowing it mr trome is such a good friend he might lend me a little but i don't know how to ask him without recalling to his mind certain words long since forgotten by him perhaps but never to be forgotten by me feather-brained as many people think me is there any one else i wonder if some things are as wicked as people say they are i here the diary breaks off abruptly but we know what followed the forgery the discovery of it by her suave but secret enemy his unnatural revenge and the never dying enmity which led to the tragic events it has been my unhappy fortune to relate at such length poor althea with thy name i write finis to these pages may the dust lie lightly on thy breast under the shadow of the flower parlour through which thy footsteps passed with such dread in the old days of thy youthful beauty and innocence end of the epilogue recording by mary bard derby england end of lost man's lane by anna catherine green